You would see the changes or anything. If not, all in favor say aye. Is there anyone in the West Conference room willing to make public comment outside of the public hearing? In other words, is there anyone giving public testimony for the Environmental Services Committee outside of the public hearing? You want to repeat that? I don't know if we want to give testimony. Oh. Uh, everyone in the West Conference Room is here for the public hearing, correct? Yes. Yep. yep. So they all hold their comments until that begins. All right. Anyone online? Can you call in? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's Anyone calling in that wants to speak a public comment? Anyone calling in want to speak on public comment? That sold on auction last week. Your Eureka property that deeds are completed on that. We have our money for that one. That one is complete. And the two property by Menards, um, we're finishing up the paperwork, but they're being listed through a real estate agent. That's in process. So we're on track for those. Sure. And that's it. We have questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Advisor Connell, we got a, a message here. Um, the password is uh, incorrect, so can I just make that announcement? John Wadman from Information Technology upstairs oh. sent us a message saying that the password to access WebEx is incorrect. Oh, yes. So can I just let the folks who are calling in know that? Yes, yes. For those who are calling in, the password listed on the website for this meeting is incorrect. It should show ES meeting. Again, ES meeting. ES and M in uppercase, E E T I N G in lowercase. E S M uppercase. E E T I N G lowercase. Will they be able to hear you if they're not in the meeting because they couldn't enter the call? They're calling in. I'm just mentioning that to the callers. So they can hear that. They can hear okay. that. Thank you, Kim. Ask for public comment again then. You say, could they hear that?
Is there any callers want to give testimony in public comment? Are there any callers who want to give testimony in, in public comment? Uh, number 8A, update of the Stellar Trail Master Plan. Um, we have received um, correspondence from the DNR. Last Friday afternoon, they sent us a letter. Um, it has been shared with those folks who have requested it. The letter really um, is a little broadly written. Um, staff and I as well as others have sat down and went through it. And we, um, we look at it as an invitation to sit down to talk with the DNR. And that will happen as early as this week, we're meeting on Thursday. Um, preferably the staff, um, an elected official or two, of course, um, corporate counsel and Vince will be meeting virtually with the DNR to go over their review of the of the master plan submitted for the uh, the Stalin trip. So, with that said, um, at our subsequent meeting, December second or third, we should have uh, more concrete uh, details. We'd want to listen in on that. Can we do that? Well, that's the thing. The challenge is we reached out to them to, you know, expedite and have a meeting with them. Well, they needed a visit with all their colleagues, and they found a date and time, which again is tomorrow. And they initiated the meeting. So we're using their virtual platform. Um, they just simply provide us with a link. Um, and what we're going to do is meet in this room because we can space out and be safe and responsible and just use this technology to have that conversation. Um, you know? Um, or would you rather not have? I just don't know. If we were to send you the link, then you're a participant as well. Or um, if I would come here and sit. Or you could come here and sit. Public meeting then? I don't know. I, I would want to be careful that we don't get a quorum of any of the committees there. Also, I want to encourage kind of that free and open discussion. Um, the more number of folks that, that I think participate might stymie some of that yeah. really robust discussion. Um, but yeah. I think it's fair to say this letter was extremely vague. Mm -hmm. And they almost begged us to say, let's have a conversation and we'll give you the details. Uh, okay. So we're going to get the details from them. Okay. okay. I used to go staff. Yeah. 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 And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to bring it forward and then it'll be more of a public. But <clears throat> right okay. now, let's have an open dialogue yeah. because we're not not impressed with their It's not a notice meeting. Yeah. No, it's not a, it's a standard. Right. It doesn't fall under the open meetings law. As long as we keep any staff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're better off than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe the county board chair he's inviting a couple of guests, other elected officials at the state level, and then staff. And of course Vince and Malia. Yeah. And that's that's a good group to, you know, explore some of the content of the letter. Yeah, and, absolutely. But like I mentioned, you know, sharing the next meeting we'll have We'll have a lot of detail for you. Okay. 
And just to put some historical context, the first go round with the original master plan, it was kind of that same thing, except we went to Eau Claire pre-COVID and had a meeting and, and the only elected official from Polk County that was there was Supervisor Mills. Okay. Yeah. Actually, we drove to Eau Claire. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And there's been some turnover at the DNR as far as personalities and, and, and that sort of thing. So it'll be good to have, you know, develop that relationship again, kind of as a collective. Okay, that's good. There's been some movement there. Um, 8B, Parks Trails Advisory Group. Um, we had our third meeting on Monday, Monday evening. Um, the consensus is we're going forward, we're going to continue to meet face to face because it is a group process. Um, I think we do have the ability to do a virtual, but talking to the group, the consensus was that we'll continue to meet face to face. We meet once a month. Um, again, um, we've gotten to the point, we're moving rather rapidly, where we've identified our top three issues. Um, those being one, um, Old County did, needs to do a better job marketing um, their recreational opportunities, whether that's way signage, branding, um, promoting the recreational map viewer. We're really surprised about that. And it's funny, even this morning I was talking to a, a resident and we're doing an ATD trail in Sea Creek Falls. There isn't a lot of people that know we have that recreational map viewer. And that's confirmed with the PTAC group. It's a great resource. It's accurate. You've all looked at it, right, on our parks page. What do you mean, Sharon? So this is a tool that, you know, I think the PTAC can help promote and get out there. And, and as the staff can improve as well. So the first issue is, again, that marketing piece. The second piece is an inventory of all of our recreational assets. And I'm not just me talking about Polk County owned parks and trails, but also doing some outreach with our communities because they have their own opportunities as well um, with the state, state and federal lands that we have in our, in our county. That hasn't been done, sort of a mapping of the, an inventory of all those uh, green spaces and public domain. And then the third issue that we're going to tackle is the big picture one, the big game changer, which is finding space, corridors, arteries, easements for all user groups to recreate. And so that's a big, big idea. So by consensus, this group of representing a multi uh, diversity or a multi set of, uh, of recreational users has agreed those are the top three issues. And so on Monday, we again confirmed those were the top three issues and, and we've started action planning. So we did a brainstorming exercise, had some really good ideas and we've given them some homework and we'll be meeting again December 21st. Okay, so that's it. We'll say um, Doug Johnson happens to be, well, a great participant, but he also is on the ATV UTV Council and is a great, really good liaison between the two groups. I just want to point that out. You know, Kim, again, we didn't schedule the public hearing correctly. It's 9.15 and <laughs> we can't. <laughs> Jason's got some stuff. Is there anything I need to say to you? First of all, I think we can tackle the fence issue. Um, the gentleman that was here at your last meeting um, is a resident of the town of Clown Falls and 
great incline falls actually. Um, he constructed a fence um, right along County Road I. If you're familiar with the bar in Clam Falls, he owns the dwelling immediately to the west. Um, and the fence that he constructed is between the dwelling and the bar. And basically, one of the issues that he is running into with the ordinance is that our ordinance says that a fence is a structure. So then the, the fence has to meet the structure setback from a road. And when we get to a lot of other sites in the county, I can show some the 11, the, the, this one? The hill. And then, and then let's just go uh, so short fence. Oh, sure. There you go. And then the local site. No so the way that the ordinance is currently, any privacy fence has to meet the 75 foot leg step. If you can't change that, that's a DNR rule uh, because it's considered a structure underneath the statute definition. Um, so that we don't have anything to say about, but what we do have something to say about would be the road setback. So this being a town road, there would be a 30 foot from right away setback off there. So this here would be the right away of South Shore. It's 66 feet wide. We would have a setback of 30 feet. So on this property line, the only area that a privacy fence could be constructed, that black dot to this black dot. Within the black lines, that would have to be an open fence, okay? Um, that gentleman and that we brought this up and that and I brought it forward as something for you guys to look at possibly in the ordinance because I don't think we've ever spent a lot of time as a county on types of fences and fence regulations. Um, one of the big concerns is, is that a fence could be 35 feet tall right now. That's something to consider that the highest I've seen is 25 feet. I've actually documented it because before the rule changed um, and that he wanted to build it as tall as he could, but we got a 25 foot privacy fence on Summer's Lake. So um, it's pretty obtrusive in that. And I just think that, that there could be some clarification provided in the ordinance for that. Those black lines, the reason why an open fence is different Basically, an open fence would be what uh, Chapter 90 of the Wisconsin statute, the fence laws, would allow. That's a, basically a boundary fence. So if you think of the old uh, farm pasture where they're running, you know, fences down to the water. If you think about pastures right now that where they fence right up to the right away of the town road, you know, those are all, you know, for like a cattle fence. Those are all open fences, and that's, that's why they're treated differently. But the privacy fence issue, that's where everything is set back and uh, could be an issue. I had another drawing, but you, you can see a lot of these buildings, you know, that are already in place may already even be closer, you know, and that than what the fence would be. So that there would be some protection or privacy if they wanted to block that. Can you pull up the other one, Bob? Yes, there. Oh, yeah. This one's uh, probably a better example because this is on a, a lake where we have uh, shorter lots. Um, it's actually quite common in a lot of places. So this is just south of town here. You can see 75 feet on the lake comes back here. Um, really doesn't provide any protection, you know, on that for the front lot. But again, we can't do anything about that. But let's say that the guy here really doesn't want to look at all this stuff and his boats and stuff here and that. Right now, he can't have a privacy fence except for the little area of the yellow line there. Um, and that if the county wanted to, and then you guys could change it, and that's so that they could go it out to the right of way one. So, um, just some things to think about. Um, as staff, I would like to see you at least confirm, um, and that that you're okay with a 35 foot, you know, tall fence, um, and that. So I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and then I also think in that that um, we should maybe look at 
you know, obtaining some kind of a setback to a side property line for a privacy fence so that somebody can maintain it. Um, that's, that's a complete policy decision. You know, it could be a foot, could be two feet. A lot of areas around here in the cities and that require three feet, you know, and that like a three foot setback for a privacy fence off the lot line. Um, any open fence though can go right up to the lot line or on the lot line. Um, so anyway, that's just some, some ideas. I do have um, some examples in that ordinance text. Proposed, uh, right there. Right. So how far do they have to be today from the lot line? Yeah, so right now, and that open fence can be placed on the lot line yeah. as like a boundary fence. Yeah. And that privacy fence can go right up to the lot line. And that, but it has to remain on your property. And that's that you own the lot line. Which, which I'm fine with. That it's just we're kind of unique in that because most of the counties and most of our local municipalities require some kind of setback. This is just coming out of the Shoreland Ordinance now. Um, one of the things in that, or one of the areas that I think it'd be easy to put in a height, um, would be right in the definition of what a privacy fence. So basically, a privacy fence we, we consider has to be at least four feet tall. And at least 50% opaque or solid. Okay, so if it's less than 50% opaque, then it's going to be an open fence or it's going to be privacy. If it's only, you know, a solid, completely solid fence, but it's only three feet tall, still doesn't meet the definition of a privacy fence. Um, the 10 feet there, I just threw that in for an example, uh, but we could simply say that basically by adding that sentence, we would have a minimum and we'd have a maximum. So the 10 feet is completely our. Then we should really define an open fence in our ordinance. Um, and, that, and that's basically just the opposite, uh, where it's composed of, of uh, less than 50% opaque or more than 50% open spaces. And then I wanted to clarify for the purpose of any legal boundary fence would be considered an open fence. And I think that you can take and make the open fences different. You know, and I know several areas around the county where we do have some 10 foot tall deer fences um, and stuff. Um, so maybe that would be taller. So these are just examples. So not trying to limit that to anything. So um, scroll on down. This is our road setback section of the ordinance. Um, and this is what I'd like to have some clarity on in the ordinance would be, you know, basically exactly, here's a privacy fence, here's an open fence. This is what you can do, this is what you can't do. It's basically just exactly what I went through. Um, we, we can put in a setback off a side property line here, like two feet. And then just clarifying that an open fence can be placed on the property. So, you know, I went kind of fast through that, by no means do we have to make anything up today. Um, just trying to find some Come back to our next meeting. Yep. So, we want to make some changes to the comprehensive ordinance, too. You know, and that if we were going to be changing one, you know, so that it would apply everywhere in the county. Right now, it's kind of a piecemeal. If you kind of got to understand, you know, the administrative code of NR 115 and then the statute and the ordinance in order to really come up with what I've gotten right here, you know, on that, which is very similar to how we enforce right now, um, except for the reduced road setback for, for the fences and any height limitations or side yard setbacks. Those are the three changes. Otherwise, everything else is simplified. <coughs> Take a couple minute break before the public hearing. Yeah, I know. The first room also take a little bit longer. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Um, yes. Yep, it's Brad. Brad Olson here, Kim. Just checking to make sure you can hear me. Yes. Congratulations. Right. I've never done that before. Sure. Yeah. 
935. The first request here is for Josh Rondo request a conditional use via section 10.4.5 parentheses C parentheses four of the Polk County Comprehensive Land Use Ordinance to operate a junkyard, salvage yard, and then and re recycling center. Uh, property affected is 202 70th Street. The south half of the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter, section 24, town 32 north, range 16 west, town of Black Brook. Parcel number is 010-00616-1000. With that, if you could pull up. Hey, Jason and Bob, this is Tim up in West Conference. Can you share that screen? Yep. Thank you. Pull up the Rondo aerial. This is just kind of an aerial view of it. Um, the property is 20.63 acres in size. Property is 20.63 acres in size. Uh, Josh Rondo, the owner, and then he does own the next 20 to the north too. Um, it is basically the building is sitting right there where that red square is. Uh, there's a 50 by 104 foot uh, building there. Uh, there's a large gravel parking pad, which I got pictures of that I'll take and show you later. That's coming out here. Um, the driveway comes right in along here. And uh, kind of a little bit of a slight curve going down towards the building. This uh, red line here, there's a major transmission line there from Dairyland Power Cooperative. And there's a substation right here on the corner. This area here, um, so basically the northeast corner of the parcel is wetland. Back over here, or roughly 690 feet from this east property line over, there's the Black Brook, the Little Creek, and that that runs down through. You'll see some public comment in that in regards to that. Um, the property all drains and that towards the northeast, like this. This here area is pretty flat. I probably got that building a little too far north. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you could see that there was a difference there. Um, so this here is pretty flat and it all slopes down going to the well. There um, was a the shed that's on site. Uh, the, the aerial image here is from 2015. The shed that was permitted was in 2018. So that's when it was built. Too. Um, in 2018 as well, uh, the applicant applied for and obtained a contractor storage yard to be able to store roll off dumpsters on, on site. And then uh, in the building, he's, in that he uses it for his truck storage. So takes a truck, goes out, gets a roll off, brings it back, you know, that kind of activity is the current use of the property. The Northeast corner, of the gravel pad that's all by the shed here 
and that is roughly 230 feet off the edge of the well. With that, um, we excise this. And then um, bring up the rondel map. Okay, so this here is kind of a combination. It's a busy map. Basically, about this 1150 circle here is where the building is located. The green lines represent the different soil types in that area um, and that's the MAB soil type that's a Magner silt loam um, and, that, and it's like six percent slopes so it's fairly level um, there's some other uh, Santiago and uh, whatnot soils around it um, and then we got a lot of smaller places but pretty much all of the operations all on this Magner silt loam um, the permeability of that area is slow um, it's typically good for woods and uh, farmland and stuff, which is what the property around the building is being used for farming. This uh, blue area down here shows the depth of the groundwater or the water table um, as being less than 12 inches. And so, again, this area here, though, very limited drainage from this site would actually get to here. Um, it's all going to go to the north. That's shown by the, the contour lines here. You can see this area here, the 1136 contour, very big area, that's the wet one there. You can see that there's kind of a point here and it's just all dropping off uh, slowly, two feet at a time. But here's pretty good drainage going right there. By the contour. All right, yeah, next slide is open up all those. Yep. All right, so I'm standing on the driveway and I'm looking to the north here. The road right here, that is 70th Street. This here is the field that's going around the building. Um, the wetland kind of comes out here a little bit, uh, but then basically that tree line back there is kind of, you know, there's a little bit of woods, but then the wetland. So here's that transmission line that Darylin Power has. Excuse um, me, Jason. Yes. Uh, this is Tim again. Uh, the screen share is just showing a blank gray screen right now. It's not showing the pictures. What's that, Tim? Uh, we're just seeing the file folder, not the pictures. Do you have them pulled up before? And no. that's what I would do is go out and pull them up beforehand. There you What's go. That? There you go. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just kind of back up a little bit now that they're able to see the picture um, along the right hand side or the south side of the driveway there. That's a transmission line and that's by Gary Lynn Power. Uh, you can see some chain link fence. I think we'll see more of that in the next picture, but that's a substation. This is the access driveway going back into the property. You'll notice that about three quarters of the way back, there's two posts there. Uh, that is a gate so that they can gate it off. Uh, the area going to the north, um, and that on the left side of this picture, and that is the farm field that's around the The driveway comes out very close in that to the, uh, the road intersection here between 70th Street, which would be going like this, and 20th Avenue, which would be going like this. That is the closest house in that to the This would be looking to the south from the property or from the driveway. 
This would be the south side of the building. And then there's the scale um, Rito right there on the south side of the building. This would be the front of the building. Uh, there's some security cameras here. Important to point out. I believe that this area right inside this corner of the shed is being used as an office because this here was marked for fiber optics. I'm assuming there's internet in there for an office. Uh, there is a scale on site right there. This would be just to the south of the building. This is that transmission line again. This would be the east side of the building. Um, there is a light in between the doors here. Um, and that, of course, I was there in the daylight, so I don't know if that's a glaring issue. Um, there is security cameras on both corners of the building. This is looking directly to the northeast as the drainage of the site would be. Um, that's pretty high. This is all uh, crap rock gravel. If anything, there's maybe a little bit of a swale over there by that car. This is looking um, and that to basically the southeast. So I'm still standing right by the shed corner. The fence is back farther than that, a little bit on that side to allow people to drive in between the fence and the shed. Um, and, that, and then this corner here has a fence that goes to This is the area that you would be coming off the scale and that and driving in between the building, which would be on my left, and the fence right there. This is the camp. This would be the northeast corner of the building. So this is the start of the fence on the north side. Uh, you're able to see that the road is back there. You can see that that is a uh, higher ground when I drove down the road. Um, and that you can see over the fence, and that you can see that there's roll offs back in there. Um, the fence is roughly eight feet tall. I just thought that this was a good picture of that because you know he's trying to prevent any hazardous materials from being put in his dumpsters. This would be looking directly west back towards the building again. Okay, so now I'm at the back of the gravel pad and I'm pretty close in that to the northeast corner. And then this is that swamp area that I showed you on the aerial maps. Um, and that basically on the other side of this dirt, everything is dropping off and that down towards the road. This is looking uh, to the more of the south. This is that transmission line again. And then there's a tree stand there you might have seen in other pictures. Um, you can see that this is pretty level. Everything is going to be coming this way, though. So, uh, kind of going away from that uh, area of high water table, and, but it is going towards this wetland. Um, there is a snowmobile trail on that that the owner allows to go through back here. This would be looking directly south in that from the back of the gravel. So you can see I'm right at the edge of the gravel here, and that will come looking south. There's currently no oh, there's currently no fence going along the back side here. Uh, the fence is only on the north side, which would be behind me, and the south side here, and then up by the building, screen from the road. Uh, there's a couple pictures here you can click through. This is just the wetland. If I want to see what that looks like. Okay, I'm standing on the edge of the wetland here, looking up. You can see the Building in the background here, and that and you can see all the roll offs back in here to give you an idea of the uh, gravel pad area. And it's kind of uh, showing you know how everything is dropping off here, everything is going right down to this area. This would be the northeast corner, so that's the same pile of dirt.
This would be the south side. So this is the transmission facility. 70th Street is up there. This is the south side. That's the buffer that he's got. Uh, so perhaps in that, that he made names around there. This is just some leftover building materials from that shed. Full part of steel was there. This would be looking from that corner. So I'm at the southeast corner, looking directly north along the east side of the lot. The area that they want to sort the materials is back here in this corner. On a concrete slab that's not there yet. You can see that they also have a buffer of grass going along the east side here. When I was on site, I just took a few pictures of the roll-offs and stuff so you can kind of see about the area in between the roll-offs. I didn't see any trash in between them or anything like that. There was a couple roll-offs that did have stuff in them on site, uh, but overall very clean. Um, I was on site yesterday and there was 36 roll-offs in the, in the lot. So these here are the ones that were full. Uh, looks like there's maybe four, maybe five, you know, but there's still no trash in between the roll off. I took and I peeked through the windows. Um, and then you can kind of see that this here is that office area that he's got. There's a truck sitting in there. Uh, again, that's the contractor storage yard, is a spot to store the trucks and that be able to pick up a box and go out and deliver it. Whatever brings back. So, it's still very open. And on this scale, just kind of giving you an idea of the approaches and stuff coming up to it, um, in case that would be a concern for any of the public. Good. Okay. Um, so, again, and that the contractor storage yard allows them to store his containers there. Or it'd be very similar to a landscaper that might store his dirt or his, you know, mulch there, um, and that. But then they leave there. The request is to open it up and that for sorting of materials and that there into different roll-offs, and to allow open hours for the public and that to come in, drop off stuff on the sorting uh, pad, and then sort it into the various dumpsters based on whether it's recyclable or metal or whatever on site. So I think the applicant um, can probably tell you more about the operation itself. So we do have a bunch of exhibits, uh, Mr. Chair, and one of them comes from the town of Black Brook. That's exhibit three. And it was dated October 19th, 2020, to whom it may concern. 3D Dumpsters is currently located within our township at 202 70th Street, Clear Lake, Wisconsin, 54005. This property is currently being used as a contractor storage yard. 3D Dumpsters would like to expand the use of this property to sort recyclables from disposed items from the dumpsters rented out to contractors, businesses, and homeowners and farms. They would also like to allow customers to bring their recyclables and items to be disposed of to them as well. They have been located at this property for two years and have not caused any problems and keep the site remarkable clean. We approve of 3D dumpsters expanding their business as we recognize the need for recycling and disposal of items within our area. That was signed sincerely, Charlie Barney, Blackbrook Town Chairman. Um, with that, if the committee would be okay, I know that we got a lot of people up in the West Conference room that would like to speak, um, so I can keep track. Uh, we got 15 exhibits total, and that, and if somebody wants to speak, and that to their comments, we'll let them do it. Um, and that, and then the ones that don't speak, I will take and I will read those at the end. If that's okay, so that we get them all. Okay, probably better than me paraphrasing. Do the owner want to present anything different? Tim, is the owner up there? Josh Rondo? Is the owner up there? Yeah. Uh, if you would like to come up and. <clears throat> Uh, 
Hi, right. I'm Josh Riondo. Everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, I guess you left it off that uh, that I would describe my uh, my, my operation uh, in more detail. I guess um, Jason described that uh, I want to uh, put a, a concrete pad behind the building um, and, uh, and and bring the the dumpsters back that are that were uh, rented out to the businesses and uh, um, farms and and uh, just just people in general area. You know, likewise, um, I want to bring those dumpsters back and empty them out and sort out any of the recyclables and then reload them back into the into the containers and uh, and take them to the appropriate uh, recycling facilities and landfills and incinerator. Um, the, the majority of stuff that we take in is actually shingles and we actually recycle the shingles. Um, we, we don't, we, we have to remove all the uh, plastic and metals and, and, and uh, tar paper and all that stuff. And, and reload that so we have nothing but shingles to put back in that box. And then that when, when we have clean shingles, we take those to a uh, send paving company in Chippewa Falls and they grind them up and, and put them in their blacktop mix. Um, that's, that's the primary thing that we bring in there. Um, and the reason the business was started was for a roofing company that I own and I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't get dumpsters from, from, uh, from the, you know, other, uh, companies available out there. So I, I had to start my own in order to, uh, uh, in order to, you know, do the business I needed. Um, with doing that, I had to buy trucks and, and dumpsters and, and, uh, of course I need to rent them out to other people as well to, 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 to afford to have that equipment and, and, and keep the people employed doing it. Um, and so, so I, I started renting them out to uh, just general homeowners that need to clean out their house or um, other building contractors and whatnot. Um, I don't collect any hazardous material. Um, I, as you saw on the front of the dumpsters, it says that, you know, there's no hazardous materials allowed in there. Um, and uh, that, uh, um, I guess that's that's kind of. I, I think that's the best way to describe what I'm doing there. Um, a lot of people think that I'm that I'm applying to actually have a junkyard, um, and 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 that's that's not the case at all. I'm I'm not looking to uh, um, have people bring in uh, you know aluminum cans and I buy their aluminum cans from them. I'm just simply sorting out the the garb what, what people throw away and get you know recovering recyclables out of that so it doesn't end up in our landfill. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's the, the gist of it, I guess. Um, I do have, uh, letters from other people. I, I didn't know that I was supposed to submit it into evidence to, uh, when I checked in here. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, um, if you want me to read the letters or what, what you want me to do there. Oh, um, let me see. I believe there's three. I believe there's three letters. Um, yeah, I have one from uh, from Chuck Cool, um, which he owns property near up nearby, and, uh, and I have a letter from Frank Frenchu, and I have a later a letter from uh, David Severson, and I also have a petition that I went around and and uh, started having people sign last night that were that were in favor in the in the area and. Uh, I got several signatures of approval as well. What was that, Kim? I have to give him an exhibit number. What do you say? Give an exhibit number? Give him an exhibit number? Yeah. So, uh, if you wanted to read that first one, Josh, uh, from Chuck Cool, I've got that marked as Exhibit 16. So I, I do need a copy of all of them, but uh, that would be Exhibit okay. 16 if you want to read that. Well, you cut out on me. Did, did you want you say you want me to read it or? Yeah, yeah, if you would, and then read it. Okay. That's Exhibit 16. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, to whom it may concern, we have been a neighbor of Josh Riondo for approximately 17 years, and in that time. He has been operating a construction company and a dumpster roll-off company across the road from me. We have never had a problem with him or his companies in any way. Mr. Riondo takes pride in keeping his property clean and neat, 
On windy days when garbage can blow around, Josh and his workers make sure to pick up any debris that is in ditches or surrounding areas. He has come over and talked to us about garbage that has blown across the road in our place, apologizing and looking for solutions to the problem instead of waiting for us to come to him. He is quick to act, making sure his company can improve on service for the community. Mr. Mr. Riando's employees and trucks drive past our place several times a day. We have never had an issue with noise or driving too fast. His employees are courteous and obey the laws of the road. Josh has told us he has applied for a conditional use permit, allowing him to sort out dumpsters and have customers bring garbage to his new property, which is located less than, less than a mile and a half from my home. We support this and ask that this permit be issued. We have no doubt Josh will continue to conduct business in a professional and respectful manner. Signed, Chuck and Gail Cool. And then, uh, can you read the Frank French you one? I got yes. that marked as Exhibit 17. Uh, it's addressed to the Polk County Environmental Committee. I understand there will be a hearing on Wednesday at 930 to review a permit for 3D dumpsters. I have talked with Josh about this to understand what it is he is looking to do. I have no problem at all supporting his business move. I see no impact to any adjoining property. Our land adjoins his property to the immediate north. I don't believe we received notice of this hearing for some reason. Frank Frenchu. It, and then the last one you had was from David. Can you David, the last David Severson. Yep. That's exhibit 18. And this is this says, uh, to who it may concern, I have been a resident of Blackbrook Township for 15 years at 316 75th Street. I have saw the growth of both Josh's companies over these years. He is providing necessary services for our community and good paying jobs for people in our community. As, as a neighbor, I haven't had any issues with company or employees, and I support the growth of small business in our community. Please issue conditional use permit that has been applied for. Any questions or concerns, please call 715-554-1303, signed David Severson. And then the petition that you have there will be exhibit 19. Do you just want to read the names on there? Sure. Um, we got Rodney Ray, um, Dave View, Brian Miller, Jeremy Gale, Terry Mueller, Jim Soderberg, Miranda Gale. Um, there's one here, I, I, I can't make out the name on it, unfortunately. Um, it, it's a sign that I, I don't, I, I can't read his name to tell you what it is for sure. Um, the next one is Emily Thurud. Um, next one is Mose Borntrager. I have Gene Kiefer, Greg Frenchu, Nate Frenchu. Um, uh, Norm Hawkins and Jeremy Hawkins. And that that's all of them that I had time to talk to. <laughs> the other exhibits, yeah. You want me to read them in that or paraphrase them? Okay. Uh, let's back up then. Exhibit one was a letter of opposition from Eugene Solman. It was dated uh, November 9th, 2020. I live north of the proposed dumpster service being requested for approval. Josh has been operating his service since 2019. He spoke to the neighbors about the use of his property on 202 70th Street, including me, before he started using the property for dumpster storage. He assured me and the other neighbors near this address that he was only going to store empty dumpsters on site. The building on site was to be used as a garage for trucks. Myself and others did not oppose to this plan. 
because of his word and guarantee not to use the property as a collection site for any material, junk, garbage, and any other pollutants, and we wanted to be good neighbors to him. His application goes beyond his authorized use by the zoning department office, a dump site open to the public for recyclables is an opening for this proposal to become a junkyard and storage for anything as well as booting materials. Open to the public suggests that it is not going to be staffed and regulated. According to the submitted application, he is going to add an additional business to the town of Blackbrook on this site. He already is operating this business on his land located at 314 75th Street, Clear Lake, where he lives. He has enough acreage 20 on that site to operate his recycling junkyard where he's presently where he's presently doing so at this time. When he or what he is asking for on his conditional use application is to provide a service already in existence in Polk County. County recycling sites provided by Polk County on several areas in the towns and villages, including the town hall in Blackbrook monthly and salvage yards north of Amory, Frederick, Osceola, and Turtle Lake. It appears that this application is an after the fact request. He has already installed a scale on the site. He could have installed the scale on his property at 314 75th Street, where he's ample room on 20 acres. The proposed location for the salvage yard on 70th Street lies adjacent to a large wetland and wildlife area. The land to the east of the site and to the south of the site belongs to Jeff and Jared DeRosier and John Wired and is part of the wetland. The drainage from the site location for the salvage yard goes to the east and to the south. The wetland is in the drain field area. Wired and DeRosiers have protected this wetland area. A small stream named Black Brook goes through this wetland and continues south into the St. Croix River. Runoff from the Josh Rondo land where the dumpsters are stored goes to this wetland. Granting this application can add to polluting this area and beyond and is unacceptable. In addition to surface water pollution, groundwater pollution is also possible. There are several wells on nearby residents that in time can be polluted from the materials sorted and stockpiled on the Rondo property. There are several criteria that the BOA needs to evaluate on this application. The list includes, and then it lists the 12, or actually 11 conditions in the ordinance. And uh, I oppose this application and wish that it's not approved for the stated information in this letter. So that was Gene Solman. Exhibit two is a letter to the zoning office from Jeffrey DeRosier. Um, his address is 164 70th Street, Clear Lake. I am writing in regards to Josh Rondo's request to operate a junkyard salvage yard and service area for recyclables and other materials. I am a landowner that has land bordering the southeast corner of his property. I'm concerned that the slope of the land to the east will contribute to contamination to the swamp and the low land that will result into running into the Black Brook. I also believe that we will be seeing light weight garbage blowing across the field. It would also mean that people would be bringing their junk and recyclables to this location, and sometimes in an open pickup box or open trailers that have a good chance of losing more garbage along the road. When Josh built there, I was told that Josh was only going to have empty dumpsters and trucks stored at this location and no garbage. I did not have a problem with that, but I am opposed to the idea of having a junkyard salvage yard service area for recyclables and other materials. I am not sure what other materials would consist of, but it leaves for an open list. I'm opposed to the request. Exhibit three was the letter from the town of Blackbrook uh, and Charlie Barney that I read. Exhibit uh, four, uh, that was exist, or we were requesting to be able to submit public comments in that uh, via WebEx and that during the hearing. And then they had a map of the Rondo property uh, highlighted in an aerial map. That was very similar in that to what I showed online. And exhibit five is submitted by John and Valerie Wire. And 
Uh, it's addressed to the Environmental Services Committee. We oppose Josh Vondo's request for junkyard salvage yard um, and that on his property, which borders ours on the west side. We also have an access easement along the south end of his property from, from 70th Street to our property. When Josh originally wanted to begin storing dumpsters, he guaranteed us that he wouldn't be using the land for anything other than storing empty dumpsters in his trucks and that he'd be cleaning the dumpsters out at his business location on County Road F. We told him we had no problem with that. We believe the conditional use he is applying for now will contribute to more litter in the ditches as well as blowing onto our land, not only from debris coming off his trucks, but also by the public hauling their garbage, recycling, and other materials to Josh's sites. In Josh's proposal, he doesn't define other materials, which leaves it open to being anything in his proposal, he states they don't accept hazardous materials, but he also told us he wouldn't have waste materials on the site, and now he's planning to do that. Also, on his proposal diagram, the proposed concrete pad is outside of the current fenced area. We also believe there will be contamination to groundwater supplying our well, drinking water, and the wetlands on our property, neighboring properties, as well as the Black Brook, especially during the spring melt runoff period. His facility is built on a high spot of his land and the surrounding land slopes towards ours and neighboring property. We respectfully ask that you deny his request. Exhibit uh, six comes from uh, Seth Weir. I have some concerns and possible solutions or amendments regarding the proposal for the conditional use permit of the Josh Rondo property located in Blackbrook Township. How is groundwater, so then he's got it broke out, basically bulleted. How is groundwater runoff going to be mitigated if hazardous waste does accidentally get dropped off and it leaks into the ground from a contained dumpster? The solution to that would be to amend the conditional use permit to require a DNR approved sediment holding pond, require possible approved container to hold hazardous waste until the customer can pick it up and properly dispose of it. Uh, bullet point number two, with this drop-off station being open to the public, increased traffic and debris in the ditches from improper wood security. Solution, require a bi-weekly inspection and cleanup of the ditches along the routes of 70th Street, 75th Street South, and 20th Avenue West. Designated road to keep high volumes of traffic to the main roads. How will, and then bullet point number three, how will these items be stored and properly secured to keep from blowing into neighboring properties? The solution for that, according to him, would be to require all dumpsters to have covers when items are being stored, so blowing and overfilling of dumpsters will be mitigated have some type of a mesh or solid fence on the entire perimeter of the yard to keep the trash and recyclables contained, not allow stockpiling of any kind outside of a dumpster. And he's got parentheses except for the small amount on the slab and that being sorted. Bullet point number four, concerns of what type of recycled materials will be allowed on site and if any stockpiling would occur besides what is being sorted. For example, if a full-size size car was to be dropped off, uh, the solution propose a list of items that can only be accepted at the site. Example, tin, aluminum, iron, etc. As stated before, no stockpiling of any kind and limit all trash and recyclables to the dumpsters at a level high. Uh, bullet point number five, transport of shingles increases the risk of nails falling out on the roadway. Flat tires could be an issue for any residents. His solution, uh, hire a street sweeper to clean the roadways of 70th Street, 75th Street, South Avenue West, and 20th Avenue once a month. Transport in a fully sealed dumpster or trailer that cannot allow for any nails to fall out. Exhibit seven was submitted uh, by Kyle Larson. And just this morning, I'm writing in opposition to granting Mr. Rondo's conditional use and expand. Uh, he owns 80 acres of land located a quarter mile to the southwest of the property 
in question, and uh, he feels that it will negatively impact his property overall. And uh, the first criteria, the creation or increase of smoke, dust, noxious or toxic gases and odors, noise or vibrations from heavy equipment. There's already a lot of truck traffic um, occurring on this site today. We can hear the trucks back up deep throughout the day, as well as the banging and clanging of empty dumpsters. If the use requested is granted, that activity will increase, resulting in more noise pollution from the trucks and other equipment being used on the site to 11 and a half plus hours a day, six days a week. Goal point number two, heavy vehicle traffic and increased traffic. I disagree with Mr. Rondo's, or sorry, I disagree with Mr. Rondo's assessment that vehicular traffic would decrease by 25% if this site becomes a main location of operations. As his business grows, so will the number of trucks and routes he will need to maintain to service his customers. I do not know what classification 70th Street is. However, every spring there are weight limitations that go into effect that will need to be monitored in some fashion to ensure that the trucks hauling full dumpsters are within the limits so that the roadway remains intact and safe. And then he goes on, in addition to the increased truck traffic and other vehicle traffic um, on 70th Street due to people bringing recyclables and other materials to be disposed of to this site six days a week. 70th Street is a quiet country road where my family and neighbors enjoy walking, jogging, pushing strollers, biking, etc. And I would no longer feel safe doing these activities with the increased levels of traffic. I've already witnessed a company owned pickup truck, white truck, leaving this location without stopping at the end of the driveway on 70th Street. Criteria, the prevention and control of water pollution, including sedimentation, East of this property in question, talks about the Black Brook, runs into the Silent Marsh by Deer Park. Uh, fence dump, the building and the fence dumpster are approximately 350 yards from the creek, and much closer to the wetlands that run along the creek. The operations on this site are not strictly adhered to and monitored somehow, or if an accident occurs, then there's a high probability that something undesirable could reach the waterway system impacting a number of downstream systems and users. It shows a map uh, very similar to what I've shown you with the building and where the gravel pad is. Uh, it goes on to say that it's not compatible with adjacent land uses uh, because they're agricultural fields, wooded areas, uh, location factors, domestic uses so shall be generally preferred, not inherently a source of pollution, use locations tending to minimize the possibility of pollution preferred. Uh, in closing, I would strongly encourage the committee to deny this conditional use permit outright. The site was originally proposed by the owner as a storage site only. Since then, a modern building has been constructed with commercial mechanical systems and a scale installed in preparation for something more. Past behavior is a good indicator of future performance of the local community surrounding this site. No longer trust Mr. Rondo's word that this will continue to evolve into something unsightly and unsafe for local residents. Exhibit 8 um, is submitted in that by Shannon Larson. Uh, it's got a lot of the same stuff. Um, it lived there for 15 years. The noise of the beeping trucks. Uh, Excess traffic um, and that walking down the roads. Uh, clearly, a commercial business in this nature uh, that it might not take make sense to invest so heavily in conservation as we have, only to have our work undone by moving in what will essentially be a garbage processing business. And she's against it being open to the public. That one's very much the same as Kyle's. Uh, exhibit nine is submitted by Corey and Susan Rogers. As a dear committee members, it was brought to our attention today, November 17th, by our neighbors that Josh Rondo, owner of 3D Dumpsters at Summit Siding, 
requested a conditional use permit to operate a joint carriage salvage yard, uh, which is a half mile down the road. We strongly oppose the land use request. Our concerns are as following. Reduced property value and market value of our and neighboring homes, localized environmental and noise pollution, reduced poor air quality for the surrounding area from burning and storing of garbage, contamination of our wells and surrounding waterways from spilling or leaching, increased large truck traffic on the surrounding township roads, leading to poor road conditions and increased taxes to pay for road repair. Neighboring counties are closing recycling facilities and landfills, but our neighborhood does not need to take the slack and become a dumping ground. There are already nearby recycling and salvage yards, waterman's transfer only four miles to the north. Allowing Rondo to convert his dumpster storage facility into a junkyard is not in the best interest of the surrounding landowners, township, or the environment. There are other junkyard salvage yards in the area for him to contract with for the disposal and recycling of his dumpster containers. Perhaps one should ask Mr. Rondo who wishes to start a junkyard and why he does not do so on his own backyard instead of ours. Exhibit uh, 10 was from Griffin Colbeth. And uh, I believe that the pond and the lake will become full of gas and oil and trash will fill it to the point. It will kill the fish and ducks and geese. And don't you think it would be heartbreaking to go down to the pond and see a dead duck in the water so we can that by not letting them do this isn't that the point of the county to see amazing birds and things like that so I say not let them do this do not but do it for the wildlife and there's a little drawing there so that's a pretty young member that there so that's why I was kind of The next one is Exhibit 11, submitted from Paul and Heidi Colbeth. Uh, just going to jump through it. They're in opposition. Uh, and they say, shouldn't the property be rezoned in that for a future business or commercial use? Noise pollution, road restrictions and integrity, pollution and environmental concerns, uh, wildlife concerns, uh, the base of Black Brook. And then they end with listing a uh, list of other recycling centers uh, slash salvage yards. It's like there's three, six, about 14 of them that they list that are already operating in the area. Exhibit 12 is very hard to uh, read, but I think it's Robert and Teresa William. Um, they're opposed to the salvage yard. Uh, don't want it to be open seven days a week. Lots of trash in the road ditches. Detrimental to the land. Devalue the property values of the neighbors. Uh, preservation of the marsh and the black uh, brook creek. Woods will reach ground. Oh, what I can read there. Exhibit 13 comes from Jan Munson. Uh, I'm ready to let you know that I'm strongly opposed to the conditional use for Josh Rondo. As it is now, there's way too many trucks traveling on the affected town roads for the amount of garbage that I have to pick up on 75th Street now would only make it worse allowing this permit. When this site was originally put in, it was for the storage of dumpsters and a truck garage. It must stop there. Exhibit 14 is uh, from Amy Winky. And uh, to who make a main concern, I'm strongly opposed. And it lists the property information. Uh, Mr. Rondo's original land use permit was for storage only. It should remain as such. The site in question is close proximity to Black Brook, which flows into the Silent Marsh. Potential runoff from this site could greatly affect groundwater supplies. Air quality and additional noise in the area is also a great concern. 
There's already a great deal of garbage deposited on the roads of Blackbrook Township by Mr. Rondo's dumpster company that is gathered up by area residents, not Mr. Rondo in parentheses. I hate to think of the additional rubbish that would be left if his business is allowed to expand, potentially to include materials that could be harmful to the environment. So, proposed. Exhibit 15, um, another one that's very hard to read. The letter of opposition from John Roberts and Eve Sylvan or Stellar. Um, and there's way too many trucks traveling on the road. The amount of garbage in that along 75th um, would only make it worse. Um, was originally permitted for only the storage of empty dumpsters. Must stop there. Valuing properties. Um, Concerned about truck traffic seven days a week, early a.m. to late p.m. Garbage and nails and screws and pieces of sheet metal falling off on the roads. Um, worried about getting flat tires on the autos, trucks, and tractors. Um, impact on the environment being close to the wetland. Basically, what I can see there. So, and then. Uh, Mr. Rondo read in the record exhibits 16 through 19. That's all the exhibits. You don't have any way back. Do you have any I was just asking if I could respond to some of the concerns that I heard in the letters. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I just kind of made some some bullet points as I went here. Uh, one of the biggest things I heard about was the, the flat tires. People are concerned about nails. Um, somebody had contacted me uh, early this spring that they that they had gotten a flat tire and, and thought it had come out of my dumpster. And uh, and so I, I looked at what I was doing and, and uh, um, tried to figure out, you know, how, how could I possibly be losing, losing nails? Um, on the back door of every dumpster is about a quarter inch gap so they could close. Um, I hired a welding company to come in and they welded a, a nail trap on the bottom of every door. So no, no nails can actually fall out of the dumpster. Um, and so as soon as I heard of that, I, I, I jumped into action to, to find a way what I could do to make it better. I don't know if, uh, the nail they got was, was, uh, you know, a, a nail that I dropped on the road or, you know, or, or what, but I, I, I figured out, you know, I, I came up with a, with a solution right away as quick as I could, um, just in case, um, we got the clean ditches. Um, you know, we're 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 constantly picking stuff up out of the ditches. Um, I, I really doubt much of it's ours. Um, every one of our trucks is is legally covered to go down the road. Um, we we haven't had any uh, um, tickets from the you know from the, from the police department or DOT for being improperly secured or anything like that. Um, but we we do stop and pick up any garbage that we see very regularly. Um, just because we know that if it's on our road, we're going to get blamed for it. So we we pick it up. Um, and I, I think any any road you drive down, you're going to see debris. And everybody, you know, whether whether if it's a road in, in in Polk County or Barron County or wherever you're at, there's going to be debris on the side of the road. And and I, I don't think all the blame can be put on me, but I I do do my part to pick up everything that I see and keep the area clean. Um, <clears throat> Traffic direction. Um, I, I don't know how I could how I could control that. Um, basically, there's a, um, four main ways that you could get to my property, um, to, and, and and to be able to tell people to come one exact way would be would be difficult to do. And and if I if I told somebody that uh, um, I'm going to direct everybody to come from the south, when whoever lives to the south of me is going to be upset, and the people to the north are going to be happy. Um, I, I, so I don't know exactly how to control that, but I, I don't, I don't anticipate a lot of customers bringing in stuff. Um, I, I, I would highly doubt that I would even, uh, receive two people a day. Um, you know, and, and yes, you know, there's the possibility of that growing, of course. Um, but it's not a, it's not a high traffic thing. And one of the concerns with how, how are we going to control, you know, the garbage coming out of those people's, uh, 
um, vehicles, uh, you know, so, and, and my response to that is we're not going to accept any loads if, if they come to our come to our property to get rid of their stuff and it's not properly tarped and secured, we're going to send them away. We're not going to accept their material. And, and that, that would have to be something strict. And, and if you ever go to any landfill or anything like that, they're, they're all labeled just like that. If you show up there with, with, with a load that's not secured, it's not acceptable, you, you need to go away. And, and, and so that would be the, you know, the, the best I could deal with that. And, and of course, I would post that on my website and, and make it known that you must show up with it with a with a covered load. Um, let me note on reduced traffic. Um, right now, my my trucks uh, drive back and forth between my two shops uh, um, needlessly, and, and by by have being able to sort these materials out on site, I would I would no longer have trucks going between the shops back and forth. Um, it, it just and so it would it would cut my traffic really in in half. I, I wrote down twenty five percent because I I was allowing room for for the added customers that might come in and uh, um, you know bring stuff in. So so that's you know my my own per you know my my trucks would be reduced by half going up and down the road. And then I figured you know twenty five percent was a, a fair guesstimate for reduction when you add in the the customers. Um, I had one person asked me, <clears throat> why not just do it? Why not just go somewhere else? Um, <clears throat> and uh, my my response to that is, well, it doesn't matter if I go to the if I, if I go over a mile in any direction, I'm going to have neighbors on all sides of me, no matter where I go. And so it, uh, I, I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, in in a in a good place that, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I have 40 acres there, and uh, and I'm able to contain what I'm doing within the site, um, and and keep it out of sight, out of mind. Nobody, uh, nobody can see what I'm what I'm doing there. I, I built a beautiful building, and and everything is behind it. Um, and I'm trying to be respectful to, to all the neighbors and and encourage them to uh, come to me with any problem and 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 I want to find a way to uh, to coexist with them. Um, it's not my intention to to to, to be a troublemaker. Um, I, I do like to take the bull by the horns, I guess. Um, the water control, you know, everybody says I'm, I'm you know very close to this uh, this uh, this swamp, um, and you know I don't know I. You know, just just the thought in my mind is that uh, it doesn't matter if I'm if I'm if I'm a mile from there, water still runs downhill somewhere. So no matter where I'm at in the world, the water is going to run downhill, whether if it's towards towards this swamp or another swamp or or, or anything. It's, you know, the, the water always goes downhill as far as I know. Um, of course, we 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 uh, suggested in the plan that uh, um, we would we would try and control the water with having a, um, vegetative grasses. Um, for, for where the water flows off our property to to filter that water out to keep the contaminants from going um, any any further than my property. Um, <clears throat> I got you know one one of the notes was about the beeping trucks. Um, there's there's no DOT law that I have to have beepers on the trucks. Um, the trucks came that way. Nobody has nobody has verbally asked. You know nobody has told me anything that that the beeping on the trucks bothered them. Um, I don't believe that there's a reason that I that, that I wouldn't be able to disconnect them to uh, to satisfy them. Um, I, I would have to look into it, um, but as far as the DOT goes, that, that that's not something that's required. Um, it may be something that my insurance requires, so I would I would have to look into that. I'm not sure, um, but I'd certainly be willing to look into that and uh, and and find a way. You know, and 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 maybe maybe I could find quieter beepers if you know if if I needed to, or you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a a, a way a way to do this um and uh the, the the reason for you know not staying where i'm at now at 314 75th street um the the, the number one reason is we're, we're we're planning on selling that house and and moving down to this property that we're talking about we, we intend to build a house in between that shop and the road um we do have sewer and well in there already um, and we, we we have a we have a an area there to to build. We, we plan on just building a one level home there for for my wife and I as our as our after our, as our kids move out. Um, so we're just in preparation, and, uh, and and that's that's the reason to 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 make the move. Um, and uh, the uh, the other thing is, uh, let me see. Well, I, I I just plain need more room too. Where you know where I'm at now, I do not. I, I don't have the. The, the room 
to properly contain everything. I, I, I just don't have the space to do it. Uh, um, one person mentioned that I have 20 acres there. Well, I, I don't have 20 acres, but it's, it's all, it's all pine trees that I planted for, for, uh, for forestry. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I just don't want to take them down and, and, and we just, we, we want to move the house. The house that's there is too big and, uh, and we just don't need it anymore. And, and so it's time for a change, but this would allow me more room to, to contain what I'm doing where, where nobody will see it and, and, uh, and be, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't bother anybody as far as I, as far as I know. Um, operating hours. Um, I think somebody said that it was like 11 hours a day. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing uh, one person had mentioned to me, uh, yesterday when I was speaking with them that, uh, that they would prefer that, uh, I didn't invite customers to come in, uh, you know, early in the morning because they people are out walking their dogs and riding their bikes and and that kind of stuff and and I can understand that willing to willing to adjust to that. Um, you know, same thing on the evening side of it. Um, you know, just I, I I wrote some hours in there and I'm and I'm open ears to 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 adjust to to, to help fit the community better. Um, I uh, I think. Uh, I think that covered most of the, the bullet points I wrote down. I'm sure there's many I missed, but. All right. Members have questions. Questions. Cutting out there. Supervisor Olson. Supervisor Olson, do you have any comment or questions? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear the entire question. He's asking the supervisor. Oh, Supervisor Olson is on the line. He was oh. just asking if he had any questions. Okay. Right now, Jason, we're looking at this list. That's the list of in the ordinance and that that was in that one public comment and that uh, you know. just clear, clarify for me uh, we looked at the gravel area that screened and then we looked at the farm field coming in along the driveway. The farm field is not an intent of going out into that. I can try. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm a little bit and that the farm field there around it on that would remain as it is. Be what? It, it would be the same as it is. So, yep. But the, it'll be contained pretty much in that gravel area behind to the northeast. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Basically, these are what we're down this list. Just, uh, I don't see hours of application. On the conditions yeah. report, the quick conditions list. Yeah. yeah. That may be on another page. Yeah. yeah. It was on a yeah. task. Do you think that's too many? Uh, Seven days a week. Uh, proposed hours of operation for sorting are Monday through Friday, eight to five, and for open to the public, it'd be Monday through Friday, eight to five as well. But then Saturday from uh, eight to noon. Yeah, really, was just six days a week. Now, so. Any motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's see. Is there anybody else? Yeah. No. You're, if you're finished, you can. Okay. Step away. And All right. Very good. Thanks start. for listening. Thank you.
You can come up one at a time and just state your name and your address and then continue your comment. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle Larson and I am at 720 17th Avenue, which is about a quarter mile from the uh, property in question. I just wanted to respond quickly to some of the comments that uh, Mr. Rendo uh, made here just recently. Uh, and I'll just I'll be brief. So Nails absolutely did a wonderful job on the dumpsters and being able to control hopefully the nails that are coming off of the dumpsters, right, with the welding. But if he has people coming in uh, with their rigs, they're going to have, you know, he can't control that. So there's still going to be some type of a debris issue occurring um, on the roads going to his site. Um, traffic doesn't anticipate a lot of people. However, I would assume Blackbrook Township would discontinue their um, their their uh, garbage collection at the town hall and just send people down to his site. So I, I definitely see a big, large increase in vehicle or traffic on the roads going down to his site over and above his, the normal reach that he would have just by having that business operating there, taking from watermen and other, other local areas. Um, locations, he said no matter where he goes, he will always have these issues. Absolutely, because he's trying to change a beautiful rural area into an industrial complex, right? He's, he wants to uh, sort garbage there. And I get it, it's a need, and, and I'm all for small businesses and expanding, but let's do it at a site that's already zoned commercial. Let's do it at a site that already has um, this type of negative response to the community already there, so it's not, it's not a blight on our area. Um, water condition. He said that water always runs downhill. Absolutely, that's uh, physics, right? However, the, the site that he's at is very close and near to the Blackbrook stream and the uh, marshy areas. Uh, so a better place would be something that's not as close to the streams. Uh, beepers, unhook the beepers. That's a nice gesture, but I think that would be a safety risk for not only his crew, but customers when he goes pick up uh, at customers. And then, um, and I have one quick comment. Oh. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So uh, my recommendation again is that we we uh, decline or deny this uh, proposition. Thank you. My name is Charles Babcock. I live on 709 20th Avenue, which is just uh, property to the west. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to make a few comments about the county board on this. They dropped the ball a year ago because this was never presented to the public a year ago when this was to be zoned. Uh, and most of the neighbors in the neighborhood were supposed to it then before Josh even built. Uh, and uh, uh, he, Josh come to my place and I opposed it then personally to him, told him that it wasn't the fact of what he was gonna do that day, it was a fact of what was gonna happen in the future. I says, the day you sell it to waste management, I says, waste management will come in here and get it its own industrial, and then where does it leave us? As far as his beepers on his trucks, it's an OSHA issue, so therefore he cannot eliminate them beepers on his trucks. So, uh, that's about the only comments that I've got to make. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Teresa Williams. We live at 229 70th Street, which is just north of his property. Uh, we were never notified. Our neighbor notified us, and a lot of the other neighbors weren't. I oppose it, um, not only for the fact that um, his trucks go by us all the time, constantly. Um, we have had flat tires on our tractor and on my truck, and we never had them before he started hauling junk. And the paper has, he does have it tarped, but we have seen stuff fall out from his trucks. And um, I feel that if he is allowed to put in 
um, this. He's already got property where he's doing it. He, he has property. I understand that he has some property across the road that does have a right of way that he could build it right across the road. He does not have a pond or a drainage area or a creek where he's at right now. And I feel that he's going to contaminate our waterways and possibly our ground drinking water. And I definitely oppose him. Thank you. Oh, yes. And he told us that when he first started out that there was going to be just store empty containers in, in his trucks. So we were lied to. I'm Eugene Solman. I live to the north of this proposed site. And uh, I've lived there for nearly 50 years. Uh, my address is 683 25th Avenue, Clear Lake. There's been a number of good comments made uh, in opposition to this application. And I think the one that probably is most meaningful to me is that when the uh, county board or the board of adjustments or whomever uh, approves a site for something that has the potential of pollution, that application, if it's approved, stays with that property. The next owner of that property could do something uh, that would be less desirable than maybe uh, what Josh's intentions might be. And that long-term look into the future thing is extremely serious when we have uh, the potential for groundwater pollution, we have the potential for surface water pollution into a wetland that contains Black Brook, that wetland drains into the Silent Marsh, it drains into the Willow River, and eventually that water enters the St. Croix River. There has been a number of studies done on the pollution from Clear Lake and that surrounding area uh, due to that watershed. I have attended some of those meetings. Mr. Reindahl, Reindahl rather, uh, has uh, violated his trust, in my opinion, to the neighborhood because he stood in my house and told me that there would be nothing other than empty dumpsters there on that site. Now it's different. Okay, it's different if you approve this this time, what comes next? And that's the, the real rub on these kinds of issues. We've seen it many times in Polk County. Polk County has taken a number of steps to keep Polk County uh, clean and a welcome to tourists and so forth. We don't have a landfill in Polk County. The reason we don't is because the county board didn't want to have it. They were concerned about pollution and garbage and whatever. So they set up a recycling center. That recycling center is serves the entire county with dumpsters that are sealed. Every community has those. Black Brook has those. They're there four weeks, or excuse me, four days out of the month for people to bring their recyclables uh, to the town of Black Brook where the town hall is. That collection point is staffed with one to two people, sometimes three. So it's kept in control very well. Mr. <clears throat> Josh supplies the dumpster uh, for one week, or excuse me, one day out of the month, so it's on a Saturday, every month, for the garbage collection. So the service is already there, practically next door to the site that uh, Josh wants to uh, 
get going. I I take my my daughter's uh, recyclables up to the village of Clayton. The dumpsters are there. Turtle Lake has them, or not Turtle Lake, Clear Lake has them, Amory has them, all kinds of centers to collect recyclables. We have a commercial uh, garbage pickup in Polk County, probably more than one, but Waterman's is right close to Amory. They go around and they pick up the garbage in containers every week. They also take in uh, other materials. What's interesting about their site is all that garbage is handled indoors. They back the garbage trucks into a, into a building, they're dumped, they're sorted, and it's pushed into a semi-trailer and then hauled away. It's not, a, it's not dumped out into the open air. I think that's pretty important. These dumpsters that are being used by Josh are not totally water containing. Water will get out. We don't know as a public what is in those dumpsters. It could be almost anything. And if we're going to dump them on this site and then sort, we're increasing the possibility of pollution. Some pollutants will become part of the water stream, and you may not even see that. And it, because the water does drain towards this wetland, uh, that pollution potential is strong. Even if it doesn't uh, initially get there to the wetland, it's going to be trapped in the top uh, inches of soil between his property and this wetland. That can lead eventually to groundwater pollution. My well is 200 feet deep. I wonder what the water table is at this site. It's completely downhill from where I live. The, the road uh, usage since this is open uh, has increased tremendously. These trucks are going back and forth uh, many times a day. <laughs> Neighbor to the site where Josh lives said that uh, things blow across the road onto his property and Josh manages to pick them up. I think that says a little something about the containment of this material that he's trying to deal with. As I passed by his property this morning to get here, I saw a dumpster sitting at that site where his home is, full of material, untarped. Now, we know for a fact, too, that these dumpsters have been appearing at the site that he's asking for the conditional use permit. I'd just like to say again that if, if this application is approved, that stays with the property. So the next owner, whoever that may be, may have a door to open to make this situation more, um, more of a problem for contamination. He, Josh stated that he cleans the ditches. Well, that's interesting. I know that uh, John Wire cleans the ditch. I know I clean the ditch. I've never seen any of his employees on 25th Avenue cleaning a ditch. Another interesting thing is when you read the agenda for the town board Black Brook meetings, frequently there are there is a, a listing on the agenda for the junkyard containing kinds of materials on different properties in the in the town of Black Brook. Obviously, uh, the town board is interested in keeping things uh, neat and clean and uh, not a contaminant because it appears on the county or excuse me on the town agenda frequently. 
That's interesting. One other comment that I have uh, that I find uh, rather intriguing is that Josh said that he has pine trees around the property that he lives on. This is what Josh told me as to why those trees are there. He did not like the smell of French use manure that it was spread in the area. So he planted these trees. Well, I guess not in my backyard, but he's perfectly willing to add to contaminants to our backyards. I don't, I don't wish to be a mean person, but the people that live close by it to this application site have tried to be good neighbors. We did not come here to complain about him having this building and storing empty dumpsters. There was an agreement between neighbors and him that it would remain as he said it would be. No garbage, no anything, just empty dumpsters. <clears throat> One more thing. Polk County, uh, and I, like I said, I've lived in Polk County for 50 years, actually a little more than that. I've lived on the site where I live now at least 48 years. <clears throat> the area has been agricultural. The farmers in the area have taken reasonably good care of the property. And now we want to bring in something that contains contaminants or junk or refuge or any kinds of materials that we really don't know what we're going to see. That's not compatible with the land surrounding this application site. It's not compatible at all. Have you having been a former agriculture teacher, dealt with farmers for years and years and years, that was my job as a college uh, employee. And I can't see that this is a good thing for Polk County when these kinds of facilities that he's asking for are already provided by the county and by commercial enterprises. I object to this strongly. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I just want to say, sounds like a broken record, but I'm concerned about the runoff. Our land borders his. Um, I probably should have started by saying this. Not everybody does the right thing as far as contaminants and things. I mean, we had a contractor recently come out to the house and, and restain the house and the deck and all the mineral spirits, all these contaminants are in a bag of plastic containers and metal containers. Uh, you want to take this? I, no, I not really. He said, well, I'll throw it in the dumpster. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it, you know. People don't always do the right thing. I pick up the pictures, like Gene said. I, I found, <laughs> you name it, I found it there. Needles, pipes, drugs, crazy. But anyway, our land borders Josh's. It goes downhill. The pollutants, if anything, if there's any runoff, any pollutants go into our property first, then to Rocher's. It doesn't go into anybody else's property. It runs into ours. We've had fish in our pond close to our house that come up um, the springs where there's a lot of uh, a lot of runoff. The creek gets high. There's fish in there, and they got into my pond just 
south of the house a little bit. Um, I'm concerned about the runoff. That's my main concern. Now, can you state your name and your address for us? Oh, please? I'm sorry. John Lyer. Um, and we live on 25th Avenue, 664 25th Avenue. And we have an 80, and like I said, it uh, bumps up against uh, Josh's land. And, um, and it's downhill from that. It, it, anything will run into our property. John, maybe you should state that this piece of property that he's on is highly erodible, and it's more than a 6% slope. That's right. We used to ride yes. on it. Yes. We used to ride horseback <coughs> on it, and it all slopes down from his from the top. Yeah. Yeah. Only one person can talk that's at the table. Yeah, otherwise, it's too hard for the recording, and they have to be able to take it, create a transcript if needed. Yeah. So, just one at a time. They're saying because of the slope, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to run. You know, the water's going to run. It's like, like everybody said, uh, water runs downhill. Thank you. My wife can get up here for a minute. Hi, I'm Valerie Wire, John's wife, 664 25th Avenue. Um, you know, we like Josh. I don't know him well at all. This When he started to try to expand his business, as everyone stated, he guaranteed us that he would only have empty dumpsters there and his trucks. So again, um, seems like a nice respectful guy but there is the trust issue now he wants to expand the business what does he want to expand it to next time i agree gene solomon summed things up very well and i'm sure you remember the heavy rains we've recently had that washed out the roads to the south in st Croix county they washed over all of our land and our little stream was flowing like a river, all the ditches, drainage ditch going across Josh's land over under the culvert or through the culvert under the road to Babcocks. <clears throat> There's chance that there will be hazardous material in those dumpsters. I've seen the dumpsters, the um, recycling bins in Amory filled with non-recyclable items, and that's in a pretty controlled environment. When people are bringing their own trash in or they get a dumpster to their building site, they throw everything possible in. Could be solvents, oil, um, the light bulbs that should be disposed of correctly, batteries, and we don't know how long that material is going to sit in a dumpster on Josh's property. And as Gene said, I've seen a lot of open dumpsters on his current land um, filled with stuff. So who knows how long it sits there before Josh is able to dispose of it properly and with the rain leaching it out. And I know everyone's covered that, so I'll move on to, if he doesn't expect the public to come very much, why open it to the public? Why make that even an option? Again, the public is the least likely to have the, um, to follow the rules. And like he said, if they come with something that isn't typed right and they leave we've all seen where somebody's country road back into their woods field road somebody's dumped something there there was a mattress dumped in the ditch by gene solomon's i don't remember if it was this spring or last spring anyway it's very hard to control we've tried to make our land a wildlife sanctuary and we thought Josh would be a good fit there because there wouldn't be another house built there. Um, our wildlife sanctuary would remain 
And I realize things change and he's only trying to expand his business. However, it's the concern of the future. Like Jean summed up, who knows what will end up. And I know Josh meant this in a good way when he said, no one can see what I'm doing there. He meant that um, he'd keep it contained and decent and we wouldn't be offended by it. Well, if no one can see what he's doing there, who knows what he's doing there? Anyway, I appreciate the time. And again, ask that you deny it. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. Joseph Lynch, 187 Sunday Street. I live Caddy Corner from the property and I oppose Josh doing any of this stuff. He has lied to us already. He's gonna lie again. So he had, as you see in pictures, he has full dumpsters that are supposed to be empty. They're not covered. Stuff's going all over our ditches. I see it firsthand every day. So have a good morning. Anyone else? <clears throat> May I add a little bit more? Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Greg Frenchu. I am uh, the tenant of the farmland that surrounds Josh's building site that we're speaking of today. Um, also, on behalf of my mom and dad, who own the property just to the north of the of the property, I also live across the street from where Josh is currently doing his business of uh, sorting the trash bins out. Um, I guess what I wanted to say was thanks to you guys from zoning and, and the workings of our government where we can even have a discussion like this. Uh, I operate a dairy farm and I bump into, we, we have a lot of manure and we bump into a lot of people. And a lot of the people that are in this room are friends of mine. And uh, um, I guess I'm here because I just want to vouch for the character of Josh. You know. Uh, his character has been slashed a little bit because some of the people think that they've been lied to, but I understand in business that uh, um, at that time he, he was probably being truthful with that's all that he wanted to do on that property, but things change and ambitions change and here we are, Josh wants to change what he's doing and I can understand that from the growth of my business, so I'm not going to fault him with that, but I am going to, I will stand up and say that the character of Josh Rondo um you could see i mean he does a he if anybody was going to be entrusted with with uh handling some of the materials that may come and go out of the uh business such as this um josh is the one that uh that i think i would trust holding the baton uh, his building sites are immaculate they're picked up i do see his employees in the ditches picking up things that aren't even theirs and i do see him chasing something but if you drive by his place 90% of the time, the place in which they sort is swept every day. And I've only seen up to three dumpsters collecting things. So from an operation standpoint, I think that I'd rather have Josh running this business than uh, a conglomerate like waste management. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on this? Uh, Jason, I have a letter here handwritten from someone who had to take off early. Would you like me to read that? Yeah, if you can, that would be Exhibit 20. Okay. Uh, to whom it may concern, uh, my name is Don, I think it's Bemberick, and I reside at 259 75th Street in Clear Lake. I am in extreme opposition to the junkyard salvage yard service. Josh, I would like to operate at the specified location. Uh, I feel this is a residential agricultural area that uh, should not be charged or changed to commercial for the sole purpose of operating a junkyard <coughs> salvage yard. Families live in this area and should not be uh, subjected to the pollution, litter, and trash that will occur with this junkyard. Our drinking water will be affect affected, among many other damaging effects. Uh, if the applicant wishes to operate a junkyard 
I feel he should do so on a property that is already coded for commercial property and in a business setting. Uh, and he should leave the agricultural property at the address alone as agriculture and allow the residents in this area to keep their property unaffected. Thank you, Don Bembrick. Or, yeah, A W N. There is one more person, Chairman O'Connell. Christine Scheiber via phone would like to provide testimony. Christine? Christine? Yes. Can you hear Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Christine Scheiber. Sorry, I have a little. Uh, reverb on my end, but I'll try and get over it. Um, I reside at 260 75th Street. Um, I submitted Exhibit 4. Um, that is the exhibit. If you would look at it, it shows the number of residential properties in the area along 20th. 25th and 75th Street. Um, hopefully, it also, um, there's a bold um, outline of the property in question here. Because uh, hopefully everybody can find that exhibit. I just wanted to point out that the area is primary residential. Um, the only other business I know in the area is like the sawmill pizza kind of wedding party area and brew pub. That's a dead end street. Um, most just open on the weekends and traffic really is, is minimal. Um, so I just wanted to use that for visualization purposes to show that this is a residential agricultural area and it is not really intended for businesses. Um, some of the issues that I, I have heard others talk about, but I also want to point out is the function of the Environmental Services Committee is to evaluate the effects of safe and healthful conditions, creation of increase of smoke, dust, and noxious, toxic odors, noise, vibrations, heavy equipment, prevention and control, water pollution, drainage on slope land, location of site, site near floodplains, rivers, and streams, location of site with existing and future access roads, and heavy vehicular traffic and increased traffic. And also the need of the proposed use in the area. And I think people have talked about that. I want to first point out the ordinances, which I reviewed. I think the initial intent was there would be empty containers. So the property is currently commercially rated because according to your ordinance, that would be outdoor indoor storage businesses. With this change of use, and if it really truly is recycling, I've heard all sorts of terms used, junkyard, whatever, it appears it's recycling. In order for the proper use of that land, it has to be zoned industrial. If you look at your ordinances, okay, recycling locations are industrial type businesses. Okay, when I review the economic development committee's policies in relation to industrial use. The state law states 
66.1001, and if there is economic development to occur, you are to evaluate and promote use of environmental contaminated sites for industrial use. So this whole change of use, there should be somebody looking to see if there's an appropriate place for this type of business, okay? I wanna make it a, a, just an open statement about um, the ordinances for the conditional use. The notice to the public, you have in your policies that anybody 300 feet, I, I don't think that's sufficient. The whole neighborhood is being affected. The policy should really state any structures within 300 feet and anybody affected should be notified. We have lots of vehicle traffic and trash, but yet, He's only required to notify the nearest house. I'm less than a quarter mile away. I received no notification. The only way I knew is my neighbors came knocking on my door. This citizen notice really needs to be beefed up on, on your part. Um, and that's just a statement I need to make. Now I wanna go on to the negative impacts that I have experienced in my home. I moved into this house in 2018. This business was not um, running at the time. Um, he was just getting started. I think um, he did build the building as I, as I was living here. I've suffered. <laughs> uh, definitely a quality of life change. I moved to the country to be quiet. We saw a lot of nature out here, a lot of agricultural. We really thought it was a, a great location. Now we have traffic um, from the 3D. There's a truck that goes by my house once, at least every 30 minutes. It's full, it goes to this site. He, he drops off the full container turns around, picks up an empty, and goes back all day long. And how do I see it? Because my office in my home faces 75th Street. It's all day long. You can't walk on 75th Street anymore. It, the traffic's so heavy. In addition to that, now we have milk trucks semis, we have ATVs, we have farmers. And I'm not, I'm not um, insulting any of these people, but we never had milk trucks. We never had semis. And all of a sudden now it's become this road of heavy trap. And now you wanna add people bringing trailers full of junk, that's another level of traffic which I totally oppose. Um, I do think that there is some hazardous materials, which would be the roofing materials. If heated, they do become hazardous. There is an increase in smoke, dust, toxic odors, noise, vibrations. That's um, detrimental to our health. Um, right now, the trucks, come from the north down 75th. I have to listen to them break before they take a left on 25th. Then I have to listen to the acceleration. When we are out on our deck, we have to stop conversation because we can't even hear each other due to the braking noise and the acceleration noise. I also want to make a, pro a point that they are burning there in the evening. It's at night when no one can see. We have smelt it. We have had to go indoors and shut all our windows and doors in the middle of summer because it is really bad. It is very chemical type smelling. I don't know what's being burnt, but it's not a campfire. 
Um, I am concerned about the slope of the land. I know everybody talked about what's draining in, but you also need to think about flooding. I have worked in the environmental field for over 20 years. A lot of contamination can occur in rising waterways. So the water would come up to the site, possibly flood area, the area of, of the recycling and contaminate far more than what would might flow down. Um, there is, I just want to talk about the need in the area. Other people have talked about other recycling areas and Waterman's. I don't think there's a need. Um, what will this site look like 10 years from now? Do, is there a cleanup plan? Are you, Polk County, going to clean it up when he's done? Is there money being set aside for this? These are all really good points that I haven't heard anybody talk about. I'm also very concerned about the tax value of the homes in the area. I think possible solutions is assist this owner in moving to an industrial area that already exists. It appears to me that this change of use from the initial intent falls under industrial, which is a recycling um, business. I would also suggest not to move forward with this change of use. This will plague this committee for the rest of the life of this business. This will not go away. It's going to be problem after problem after problem. And I think you can see that in the amount of people, uh, the residents in the area that showed up to comment, we're not going away. We paid good money to live in a nice area without contamination. I wanna just go back and make one point about the initial attended use of this property and what was told to the neighbors. This is a complete change of use that impacts the environment, tax lands, noise, health, um, the high traffic and increase in traffic with the new use. I request deny of the conditional use permit and I oppose this project. Thank you. All right, thank you. Did you answer a question about industrial? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, so the property is zoned to Egg 10. <laughs> And underneath the egg then uh, we have our allowed uses and permitted uses. Uh, I bring that up because the contractor storage yard is an allowed use in that zoning classification. So that's why Mr. Rondo was able to pull a permit in 2018 to use his property as a contractor storage yard and store the dumpster there um, without any public hearing or notice requirements. Um, Looking at our, our uh, actual section 10.4.5, which is the Ag 10 district. Uh, C is the conditional uses, and number four says junkyard salvage yard. Uh, so we take that and we go back to our definitions in that ordinance. Um, the definition says junkyard, salvage yard, recycling center means an open area where waste or scrap materials are bought sold, exchanged, stored, bailed, 
disassembled or handled for commercial or non-commercial purposes, including but not limited to scrap iron and other metals, papers, rags, rubber tires and bottles, a junkyard salvage yard recycling center includes, but is not limited to and that an automobile wrecking or dismantling yard or an area where more than one of the or inoperable motor vehicle is kept. And so that's why um, being that he had the proper zoning and the CUP says that a junkyard salvage yard recycling center is a conditional use um, that he was able to go through. Now, when we look at the industrial district, and that there is also an opportunity, um, but basically the allowed uses and permitted uses have to do with light and general manufacturing, including um, in that basically warehousing. And one of the conditional uses that's listed there, and that uh, number 11 is salvage and recycling. So there would be another option in that if the property was owned industrial to uh, be going through the same process as we are right now with the CUP for it. Um, also solid waste disposal operations and sanitary landfill sites are right below that. So in other words, I think it fits in both zoning districts. Mr. Chair, uh, the applicant has requested if he can respond or if he's already had a chance to respond. He can. He can. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I, this is a this is a relatively small company. Um, it, it, it uh, you know, I've heard that the the trucks are going up and down the road every every half hour. Um, I, I I would venture to say, an average of we deliver two to three dumpsters a day to customers, and in return, that that's how many we we would get back overall throughout the year. Um, construction doesn't really happen. Uh, you know, people aren't aren't remodeling their homes in the winter so much and 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 whatnot. So it's it's more of a um, of course, there's some that do, but most of what we do is, is through the summer months. People are, um, you know, remodeling their homes. There, there's new construction. Um, that's that's the the base of what we do, and uh, um, we we want to allow people to come to our place to uh, to, to get rid of their stuff because they, they don't always need a, an entire dumpster. So we're we're trying to find a, an affordable solution for people to bring stuff to a place that's open. A lot of people say, well, why don't you go to Waterman's? Well, if you drove by Waterman's on, on a Saturday, because that's the only day you can possibly drop stuff off there, they're lined up up and down the road. It would take you a couple of hours to get through there. They're only open to the public from eight to noon, and there's no other place for people to go except for to bring it to Blackbrook Township on every third, every third Saturday of the month. And me as a Blackbrook Township uh, taxpayer, I'm paying just like these people are for everybody else's garbage to get thrown away. And so I think by offering another option for people to have a place to to easily bring a place and not have to wait in line, we can we can get rid of people throwing this stuff in the ditches and, and whatnot. I'm looking for you know affordable um, ways to do this for people and, and make it simple because only having the option to do it on Saturday between eight and noon. I think that really frustrates people. And what are they going to do with that mattress when they when they leave there at five o'clock on on Tuesday and they're told they can't throw it out? Well, they they drive around the block and look for a look for a vacant area to throw it in a ditch. And uh, and and I, I so I I'm I'm you know as I said I'm, I'm not a huge company um, and I do have great respect for all these people here um, and and I and I have no uh, um, intention of uh, polluting anything. Um, 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 you know, and, and I'm and I'm open ears to if they have problems, I want to find solutions, and uh, and 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 that's that's all I want to say. So thanks again. May we reply to him? Did you do that, Mr. Chair? Not in the debate. Not in the debate. Not in the debate. She already spoke. He already spoke. Okay. All right. 
further comment. Yeah. McConnell, yeah. if you allow it, there is one more comment through the chat line. It did come from Christine Scheiber, who was on the phone. She has one more comment to add. It reads, please add to my comments. I request no weekend hours so that we may have some peace and quiet. That eight to noon operational hours. She's referring to that on a Saturday. Go down through the criteria, and if the applicant meets the criteria, or if you guys see a condition that uh, you could put into place, and that to uh, satisfy that condition, and that you can definitely implement that. And if the applicant's willing to do it, you know, then you can. Um, if they're not willing to comply with those conditions, or if they don't meet that criteria, you guys. Can you want to read the criteria, the conditions? Sure. I, yeah, I don't have that. Okay. This is coming right out the application and comes right out of the administrative provisions of the ordinance. The committee shall evaluate the proposed use on the following criteria. And they are the maintenance of safe and healthful conditions, creation or increase of smoke, dust, noxious or toxic gases and odors, noise or vibrations from heavy equipment, heavy vehicle traffic and increased traffic, the prevention and control of water pollution, including sedimentation, existing topographic and drainage features and vegetative cover on the site, the location of the site with respect to floodplains, floodways, rivers and streams, the erosion potential of the site based on the degree and direction of the soil, soil type and vegetative cover. The location of the site with respect to existing and future access roads. The need of the proposed use for, uh, or sorry, the need of the proposed use for a shoreland location or that location, what it should say. It's compatibility with uses on adjacent land the amount of septic waste to be generated and adequacy of the proposed disposal system. Location factors, domestic uses shall be generally preferred. Uses not inherently a source of pollution preferred over uses that may be a pollution source. Use locations tending to minimize the possibility of pollution preferred over use locations tending to increase that possibility. Page five, Monday through Friday, eight to noon and seven. Do have some sample conditions that I've kind of went through and compiled with his stuff and that. I can have Bob pull that up when he comes back, if you like. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of summarized like the hours of operation and stuff. Okay. So. Do you have any questions? Yet? Is he has a second opinion. Yeah. Well, 
any other concern? I made a list of concerns, but they all got covered in the discussion. It's not in a floodplain. Not in a floodplain. Um, and that, there's no navigable waters on this property. Like I said, the closest wetland would be approximately 230 feet northeast to it. And uh, from the property line, from his property line, it'd be about 690 feet to the center of Black Brook. And that, so I'm going to guess that you're at least 300 feet off the property line. So you're in that, you know, 1,200 feet or about a quarter of a mile. That's correct. Hey, Tim, can you see what's on the screen now? Yes. This is coming a lot from their application and from the public comments that I read before the meeting. Um, number one, any of these conditions, you guys can delete them, you can add to them, and then I've got a few more after I've heard the comments today that could be possibly added. Uh, just trying to speed up the hearing here, though. Uh, one condition could be that no hazardous materials will be accepted. Um, any oil, antifreeze, or used batteries will be stored inside. That that's a runoff concern, you know, and that for contaminants. Hours of operation for sorting materials and open to the public are Monday through Friday, eight to five, and Saturday from eight to noon. On the application, they had hours of operation for sorting materials, eight to five, Monday through Friday, and then they didn't have anything for sorting hours on Saturday. Uh, I tie them together in that because. But then the following condition that any hours open to the public must be staffed so that somebody's there all the time. So I don't know if that's what the applicant intended, but it makes um, everything a little better. Uh, no crushing of that, just to confirm that there's not going to be a crusher there in that to crush plastic bottles. Even. Uh, vibrations, dust, and smoke will be limited to prevent any impact to the neighbors. That one's kind of ambiguous, but. Kind of a tough one to administer. Uh, number seven, the 30 foot wide grass buffer strip will be maintained along the outside of the fence. That was just on the application that the owner is offering. Uh, no material should be buried on site. Again, on the application, no stockpiles of any material on site. Everything shall be sorted and put into dumpsters the same day it is received. That trying to eliminate the possibility of that for anything blowing around so they can't pile it there and leave it there for a week and then sort it. Um, full dumpsters will be tarped on or full dumpsters will be tarped until transported off site. Material is light enough to blow around. And to kind of make sure that this doesn't turn into an auto salvage junkyard, uh, limited to one unlicensed or inoperable vehicle on site. 11. Oh, yeah, I did. Didn't I? All dumpsters and sorting materials will be contained within the fenced area. Um, and that, and uh, one condition that could be added there if the committee want would be to take and fence that east side. And that, that's open right now. Do that if you want to. I took all this stuff out from the application and what some of the, the comments were, you know, and that. So, I mean, that's an option. That, that I see that you could add. 
there was also some testimony about you know having the, the sorting area dumped inside or under a roof possibly uh, for the environmental concerns in that, maybe a broad condition like must comply with all DNR regulations and permit procedures uh, might be something that you want to put on. And then uh, there was some public comment about burning and that, and like smelling burning and that, and you could have a condition in that that says no burning on it. So, I mean, those are some places to start. I agree that number six is too ambiguous. How do you, you got, if you're going to have a condition, you have to be able to measure it. There's no way to, that's hard to measure. Yeah. You, you, you want to have something almost, but at the same time, you know. Don't we already have things about, yeah, nuisance mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. I'm just trying to satisfy some of the conditions you know, that they had in the public comment. I don't know this. Brad here, Jason. Go ahead, Brad. Brad here, Jason. Can you? Yeah. On on number six, um, it wouldn't help with the vibrations um, or the smoke, but on the dust side, what if what if we a condition was that that uh, dust re retardant was was sprayed on the driveway. If it's a gravel driveway, um, I know a lot of towns do that to keep the dust down. It would it would be a way to um, you know to eliminate the dust problem. Anything else, Brad? That you have? Uh, number. See, my computer screen keeps jumping around. Uh, number twelve. Um, no, number eleven. So, what if the dumpster comes in and you know is tarp? But what if it comes in at four thirty in the afternoon? Um, you know, I get it if it's dumped out that it that it has to be sorted that day, but. I'm just wondering, are we in number 11, are we saying that if a dumpster comes in at 430, it has to be sorted that day? No, I think um, the goal would be is that just if it's dumped out on the slab, then it's sorted at that time. We can, we can right. that. And, and, yep, anything that would be dumped on the slab would have to be cleaned up that day. Oh. Okay. Yep. You rewrite that that one box. Yeah, everything's sorted on the slab or every, everything all materials delivered. All materials on slab need to be sorted. The Army Corps wouldn't be involved unless he was playing in the swamp, you know, and that, so. Number 15, sorting area indoors. I mean, how do you sort some of that stuff inside? Yeah. I would take that. Jimmy Coburn. I was just going to ask about 15, but you already put it on there. Right? You know, one of the things in that that's been brought up many times and that is, you know, the runoff and that and whether or not you guys would like to see some kind of a stormwater pond or something um, and that coming off that gravel area, sediment pond, basically. Could, could, could we have a... Yep. Could we have wider than a 30 foot grass buffer? I mean, for, um, didn't you say it was five, 600 feet, I think, to the property line? I mean, um, 
what if, you know, what if we had a, I don't know if it's feasible or not, but what if we had a 100-foot-wide grass buffer, you know, rather than a 30-foot-wide grass buffer, um, just to, you know, slow water down, catch more, you know, things like that. Yeah, you can make that whatever you want. Side against the road, there's that space limitation. Parallel to the road. Parallel to the road, yeah. The existing buffer, does he have 100 feet? I don't know if he'd have that on the south, Brad. Yeah. And that, so for, for sure, sure on the, the west. Yeah, I was just, I was, I was just throwing the number at 100. I was just going something bigger than 30 feet, you know, to, 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 to have a, a bigger buffer strip, you know. Oh. Probably be close. You can be specific and just say all oh, the land to the south property line, and that would be buffer, and then at 75 or whatever you want to make it around the other. To the south. How many feet buffer on the other three sides? 75. 75? Yeah. The consensus? That would be the north, west, east, west, and north. Under 11, originally it said dumpsters the same day would be sorted. I understand what Brad is saying or Supervisor Olson, but now it says, I just feel like we're leaving out the fact that then a dumpster can be covered and kept for a month. I don't know how to word that. I don't have any problem with sorting it the next day on this on the slab, but possibly wording it and they come in at a certain time. I don't know how long it takes to sort one. And after that, they, they can be sorted the next day. I'd like to see kind of like a maximum number of full dumpsters on site. Okay. And that, right? That's, yeah, already, that, yeah. that's kind of what, so that you don't have, I think he has said in his application, 94 roll offs. You don't have all 94 of them full. That's what right. I'm trying to get at because it doesn't really say that. Jerry, you might want to send that back to the applicant to see, you know, what he thinks he can handle. You know. yeah. We can ask if he's still here. Hey. Uh, Jason, are we... Yeah, Brad. Are, are we saying, um, I don't see anywhere on here. I mean, 14 says full dumpsters will be tarped until transported off site. Um, I, I, shouldn't we require that all, that any full dumpster is tarped? You know, so even the ones that come on and haven't been sorted yet um, would be tarped also. Okay. I don't know, just you know that way it, it makes sure that the uh, that all dumpsters if they're sorted or just you know just delivered to the property are are all tarped Tim, does Josh have an idea how many number of dumpsters he would possibly have on site that would be full at any time? Uh, I guess just just to give me a 
Just to give me a little extra room, uh, I, I guess I would I would ask to have a maximum of 20. Um, and, and one comment on all the full dumpsters to be tarped. Um, I, I, I am going to have a, an extremely large uh, fence all the way around this. And, uh, um, and, and, and I, I wouldn't, there, there's just no possible way I think blow away. Um, you, you are talking about, you know, I mean, if that's what I got to do, I'll do it. Um, but there, the, the way that I have it set up, there's there's absolutely zero way that anything can get out of there. Of course, you know, obviously there's, uh, um, you know, times when you get foam and stuff, I'm, I'm not, uh, um, so I, I think that all full dumpsters uh, uh, that, that have, the, have a material that's possible to be blow it out would be a, a more reasonable uh, possibility, just something to think about. We get strong winds, Josh. So now number number thirteen, the maximum no, number of dumpsters that would be full or empty dumpsters, right? They've already got thirty six empty dumpsters on site, Brad. That was interesting. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> they have thirty. They have thirty-six. Twenty seems excessive. Well, he owns ninety-four. Yeah, ninety-four total. That's how many he owns, and that. But a lot of them are out on sites, you know. But there was thirty-six of them there, and I'd say it's probably thirty-one to thirty-two of them. Various sizes, you know, smaller ones, all the way up to the big four start. Do you want to ask the applicant if he's got any other objections? Or? Let's add more. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, do you have anything to add, or are you okay with these? Um, can you scroll up just just a little bit there? I'm not sure. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, there, there was there was the one I was questioning about with the uh, the no, number fourteen that all full dumpsters will be tarped. And I, I, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I was just questioning, you know, I mean, it, obviously if I have a dumpster with, uh, with concrete in it, I, I'm, I'm not worried about the concrete blowing away. And, and it's the same thing with the, uh, um, you know, for, you know, like, like, uh, uh, two by fours, I'm not worried about the two by fours blowing away. Um, so I was wondering if there could be any more, uh, um, thought put into that, um, Meaning, like uh, anything that has the pot, you know, any dumpster that has a product that, that that has the possibility of something flying out of it needs to be tarped. So I, I don't know, just I don't know how you, you know, just I'm just spitballing. And uh, I'll throw the rain and so washes out of there. Yeah. all the dust in there. Watch out, Jim's. Was saying in that, that about being tarped, and that was uh, in regards to the rain that would be washing through the material in the dumpster and could possibly then leak out of the dumpster. I see. Okay. I understand. Got it. I'm good. All right. Getting the motion. I'll make the motion to approve the conditional use permit with these uh, 17 conditions tied to it. I'll second it. Any other questions? Right? Any other, all those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Actually, it's just a reason. I'm going to talk about how many CUPs you guys want to hand me. Do we want a new full-time job? <laughs> that's, that's how we started out. I remember. I was here. Yeah. 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 Oh, can you sign on your phone for me on that one, Doug? You want me to sign it? Yep. That's perfect. Right here. Yep. Just because this is a season. So the reason one in that kit was signed. It means that you filed in our office. Okay. I thought I'm not supposed to be the big guy here. <laughs> no. No. Perk's supposed to do it actually. Is that Awesome. Thanks. Just throw them on my desk. Make okay, copies of these and then quick frame too. If they want them back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I have to uh, check out of this meeting. I have another meeting here in just a few minutes. Okay. We'll try All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. We're done with that one. There's a rezone public hearing. Uh, is anybody left up there? Looking at a different folder. So this public hearing is the second for the day. The uh, request is from Gary Cotter to have a district change from residential A5 to general business commercial B1. The property affected is approximately four acres located at the intersection of State Highway 35 and 40th Avenue and County Road X. It's part of the Southwest quarter of the Southeast quarter, section 10, Town 32 North, Range 19 West, Town of Farmington. It's part of parcel number 022-00244-0000. The total parcel size is 35.51 acres. The applicant wishes to uh, start a mini storage or indoor storage on the proposed area to be rezoned. That is not an allowed use in the residential Ag 5 zoning classification. Um, so the you know, way to dig and do that would is be is that the property has got to be rezoned and that to one of our commercial districts, uh, either B1 or B3. Uh, the, the applicant is seeking B1 because uh, they're probably going to have a lot of roof area in that in this area, and B3 would limit them to 20,000 square feet of roof. B1 does not, so it's still limited to the four acres. The town of Farmington has their own zoning, uh, but the reason why they're before you today is because the Shoreland area, which is the green area on this map, is still under county zoning, and the part of the parcel that he wants to rezone. Is underneath your jurisdiction. So I'll pass around this mask or this app. That was part of the application. I have that too. There's uh, two small undelineated wetlands that are way on the north side of the property 
Uh, but there's no wetlands or floodplains or navigable waters and that located in the area to be rezoned on this. Um, it's located or has the town road on the south end. It has Highway 35 on the east side. Uh, there's no buildings or sewers in that in the area to be rezoned. The town of Farmington approved of the request. And that the rezone area uh, east to west is 375 feet wide. North to south is 460 feet wide. So that's where the approximately it's like 3.96 acres comes up. The county has sent out all the proper notices and published the hearing in the paper prior to this request. And with that, I would like to jump into the exhibits that we've got. Uh, there's two of them. First one is the Town of Farmington Minutes. And it was at their June 3rd, 2019 meeting, or meeting, sorry, can't talk. Uh, public comments, Gary Cotter would like to rezone a portion of his property from residential to commercial for the purpose of putting up public storage building. We will get the Board of Adjustment meeting scheduled at the next meeting. And so that was just basically his request to do it. And then that's followed up by a letter from the town of Farmington on November 16th, 2020, Will County Land Information Department. The town board of Farmington heard Gary Cotter's plan to have a storage pod business on his property located at the corner of Highway 35 and 40th Avenue in our township. The board had approved of his, his proposed business and had initially planned to rezone the property to conform to this type of business. Mr. Cotter never contacted us to complete the rezone and was left at that until we received your public notice of the rezone. The board has no problem with his proposed business. So, roundabout way, but they are in support. Exhibit two comes to us from Daniel Anderson. Um, he's our local rep with the Wisconsin DOT. And it was addressed to Polk County Zoning. We have completed our review of the request to rezone a portion of the Cotter property to accommodate the proposed indoor storage facility in the town of Farmington. WISDOT exercises no authority over zoning, so we have offered no comment regarding the request to the rezone. However, we found no record of a permit for direct access to Highway 35 and would like to inform the applicant that all access should be via 40th Avenue. We appreciate the opportunity to review this request. If you have any other questions, let me know. So that was Dan Anderson. That's it for exhibits, and that's it for what I've got. Is that? Um, Hey, Tim, is the owner up there and does he have anything to add? Yes, uh, um, got a question here um, on Gary Cotter, owner here. And uh, the question I have is, I roughly want to, I'm on a three acre site for, for buildings, combination building and uh, portable um, storage. But with that, you got the, the, the ditch, the road right away. Um, so the whole site, and this is right approximately four acres, but the actual site that I want to excavate or is three acres. Does there have to be um, stormwater holding conditions with this? And if so, how, how what would be the step to that to would it be another acre I'd have to add on to this for that? Because I, I want a three acre buildable site. Like to answer that, Mr. Chair. And that, so, uh, Gary, in that anytime you disturb more than one acre, and that it would require a stormwater erosion control plan, uh, that pond and that, that stormwater erosion control plan could be located outside of the rezoned area. In other words, it doesn't have to be zoned commercial. Um, I'm not sure if that's really feasible with the land, but from my recollection of that area, is it kind of all tapers in that to the north and to the west there anyway? Um, kind of a hill by the road. I don't know if that makes sense, but if you can put that 
stormwater pond outside of the commercial area to the west or to the north, it would still be fine. And that would be perfectly fine with me, but if it can't be put there for some reason, if I need to make this accountable, you know, to to that, because on the back side there is it, there is the hill on the west side. Um, if we could put it there, I I don't know how this gets designed or engineered after this, or you know, or is it the DNR that participates now, or or. That would be something in that that would have to be, uh, you know, figured out with your engineer. You know, so that's the only answer I've got. But right now, the application is only for the four acres. Unless the committee was willing to increase the size of that, you know, that's up to you guys. I would be concerned about increasing the size of the request because then I would think you would need to do a new public hearing. Correct. It could be substantial at all. Yeah. The, only, the only request that I would have, you know, bigger than that would be, I, I don't know the amount that that area is going to be for stormwater retention. So that'd be the only thing that would I add of any size. Like you said, could go out. The big, yeah, correct. The pond doesn't have to be located in a particular area. You go to my big water. With DNR, it's engineering. Well, it depends too. I mean, I don't know if it's all one project, if it's all going to be disturbed at one time, or if it's in phases, you know. So, that's, that's really unknown. Yeah. Your catch all condition that they comply with all of those other requirements, you know, I think covers it for purposes of what this committee is being asked to do. Is this just the zoning body? Any public that wishes to speak or anybody else? No, nope, there are none here. I've talked to all my neighbors, we're all in good standings. Okay. We're pretty much good to go. Public hearing and it's closed. the question. <laughs> what do you need? Just a motion? To a motion. Yeah. Move it and make that motion. I'll second it. Hey Gary, so that's everything here at the committee level, and that now will go to the county board for the final approval. So, right? That's all we need from you. You'll receive a letter after the county board. <clears throat> so, any direction on the area for the runoff area because uh yesterday i talked with a don and she suggested that maybe you could uh give some opinion to that or someone from the dnr so we're what would you think be a direction to go for that uh, right now? yeah it depends on how much roof you have and how much hard surface you have you know so we really need to see a, a 
preliminary plan in order to determine that. And you'd want to start with probably Ruth King with the DNR. So with, with who? Ruth King. R U D H King. Okay, Ruth King. Ruth King. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. We want to jump into the tourist rooming hall stuff then right away. All right, we pull up that proposed ordinance text again. Uh, so Chairman Nelson at the last meeting uh, provided some comments about the tourist rooming house permitting procedure and kind of referred to the past on how it was done. So in the past, uh, prior to 2016 is the past. Um, any tourist rooming house permit had to go before the Board of Adjustment for a CUP or conditional use. And since then, during the comprehensive rewrite, the Board of Adjustment was granting almost every tourist rooming house with 14 standard conditions, kind of like what we just did with the Rondo one here. And everything was approved. So they took it out of the BOA at that time and just made it a permitted use. And throughout the citizen advisory groups and everything, the conditions were reworked and that and tried to simplify it and combine down into you know a handful of conditions. Well, as you are aware, then we wound up with a couple of issues um, and that where everything got kind of taken out of control. And so I believe that's Chairman Nelson's uh, intent is to try to just keep a little bit more of a, a thumb on these and they can have a little bit more control. Uh, the conditional use side is, is going to allow you to handle every property uniquely, whereas right now it's just a permitted use, so everybody's treated the same, not good or bad. Um, in order to take and amend the ordinance, and that that would be an ordinance amendment, um, and then those applications would come to you guys. You know, and there's probably at least one a month. You know, that as far as time goes on the committee level, um, the amendment is pretty simple. Um, right now, throughout 2019, when we worked on this to a great extent, um, we took and broke it up into two different types of uses, tourist rooming halls, which had a maximum of eight people, and then we had the 12 occupants during the day, um, and then we created a transient lodge as a conditional use process for basically nine to 20 people to stay at the place. If we're going to do the changes, uh, you know, that we could take and get rid of Transient Lodge altogether and just call it Tourist Rooming House again. Um, I kind of reworded this here, uh, and that because the 12 occupants then might be uh, changing because we don't have that hard cap of eight. Um, so I just took, you know, 12 and eight, and that's how I came up with the four um, here. So that could be easily done. And then if you just scroll down, this is currently how it is. So it's just a change in use that requires a land use permit. So that's administrative. You walk in, you meet these conditions, and then the permit's issued. We'd remove that part out of this section of the ordinance. And then we'd go down to the conditional use section, and we would strike transient lodge with maximum up to 20 people and add the tourist rooming house stuff right there. All the same conditions as what was or what is current. Well, it's a pretty easy formatting change. Uh, we just get rid of Transient Lodge and go to this. Um, I still carried over the 20 people maximum in there from the Transient Lodge. You know, I mean, I don't know how much you want to rehash all of this, but we spent quite a bit of time on it, so I kept everything the same. Uh, one thing with this and that, um, 
if we're going to do stuff with tourist rooming houses, um, we should incorporate the comprehensive land use ordinance as well. Um, all of our time and efforts and then in 2019 were focused on the shoreland because we had the issue coming up here on a little balsam and that and the comprehensive ordinance was never amended in that to meet the new conditions. In other words, we have two different sets of conditions and two different uh, permitting processes basically between our, our shoreland areas and our comprehensive areas right now. So that would be a good thing to clean up if you're looking at reopening this up. Not that, not that we get too many tourist rooming houses all in the country and that, but anyway, it'd be good to have uniform rules across the board. I don't think we see you again. You don't think so? I couldn't quite hear you. We shouldn't go to a CUP. No, I, what, I, we, we clean them up, you know, between the two of you think so. But the reason I don't want to go to a CUP is Bob knows I've called him a number of times with inquiries into what are the rules. And we need a standard set in my mind because each time someone called in, you'd have one over here and one over here. And if we want to make them stricter, I'm good with that, but I think we should just leave them as it is myself. You could still leave that list as it is and then have the option of adding other conditions Boy, I thought of that. for individual applicants. Like if they came and maybe they're closer to, I don't know, a daycare, so you'd want to put extra particular conditions because yeah. of the unique nature of that property. Um, but back. Just to put some historical context, back when we originally had the issue with conditional uses, it was the number. There were so many that it was just meeting after meeting after meeting. And I don't know, Jason, how many new conditional use permit applications would you anticipate in a given year? Twelve. Twelve a year or so. So it would be and and. A lot of them might not be contested because maybe they don't have neighbors, but then you're going to have them really Most highly contested. Most of them that before yeah. the BOA were very highly contested, just like we had. Yeah. That is a lot of time. You, you could also then recommend that conditional uses go back to the Board of Adjustment. I mean, they bounce back and forth. And, Okay, you go there and just do the administrative. That's, that's too much. We'll just leave this as is in the ordinance. That we'll leave the tourist rooming house the same too until we take an event to comprehend the ordinance next time. And then we'll do a, and we'll get everything changed. But literally, we have no tourist rooming house party that apply. So. I like that idea of having the option to do a CUP if it's needed. We feel it's needed. That was a good example. Right. So the other option would be if you think that just having all tourist rooming houses CUPs because of the number, you could say anything over X number of sleeping accommodations would have to then be a conditional use. Like there would be some threshold. So the small, you know, one or two bedrooms that aren't going to be an issue would be over here, and the larger ones, like the one we had here, could be a conditional use. That's currently so, what we've got right now. And, you know, that's why we have the two different uses right now. The tourist rooming house is good up to eight people, and then you got to go for a CUP for a transient lodge from nine to one. Oh, and so, so Chris yep. was recommending just taking the everything. everything. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, Always add more conditions. We'll have defense issue on the next meeting, and we got uh, Michael Gray meeting coming back that rezone for the event barn now in South of Menards. Ah, okay. We have on the next agenda for you. Right. 
Thanks, Jason. No, thank you. Sorry about the long one. Yeah, thank you, Jason. That went pretty well, considering our environment we're living in. Um, with a heavy public comment turnout and using technology. Appreciate you facilitating that, Jason. Um, Next item on the agenda is the joint development agreement with uh, Geronimo, or now called National Grid Renewables LLC, also known as Apple River Solar LLC. <coughs> we talked about this at the last meeting. Um, there's a real interest in working on this joint development agreement. We know this because we did do some outreach with the four impacted towns. In fact, subsequent to our last meeting, Tim Anderson, our, our county planner, wrote a memo or letter to the four towns. Again, that's Lincoln, Apple River, Garfield, and Clayton. Um, asking them, well, I started out informing them that the Polk County Environmental Services Committee is assuming a leadership role, and we do plan to be an intervener or have a place at the table when the Public Service Commission has their public hearing, statewide public hearing, later next year. Um, we sent this memo out, Tim did, to again the four towns, um, asking and eliciting their input if they have any concerns or, or questions. We also provide them with information on how they can access the application materials that are available on the PSC website, something that Jason um, has done and reached out to the PSC to learn about. We did provide the towns a deadline for them to respond to us. So the deadline for them to provide any input or commentary is December 15th, which coincidentally is a day or two or three. It looks like oh, one day before our second meeting in December. So you'll hear that. And there's also interest, and as you remember, when the uh, the consultant from from uh, National Grid Renewables LLC came here. Um, for all the units of government to sign this JDA. Uh, it's really good practice. Um, I know when Jason reached out to PSC, he's mentioned that the PSC also thinks it <laughs> to be a good practice for, for units of government to have this agreement in place, particularly because it memorializes um, the project with all the parties. Um, there is you know, enforcement at the local level. Um, we can actually document those shared utility payments as well. And then you all had concerns about decommissioning. And so as far as the process goes, that's kind of where we're at. Um, we, we hope, this is our goal, that and hopefully corporate council can help us with this by the end of the year, we can have a full review of this to identify any red flags or concerns invite Geronimo or again, National Grid Renewals. I should just write that on my hand or memorize that somehow. Um, anyway, invite them back to have a conversation, maybe have some type of negotiation. Um, the idea of having a public hearing is available. It still needs to be decided. And then finalize this agreement and have county board's approval sometime in the spring of 2021. Uh, thereafter, the four towns would approve and sign, and then we could provide this along with our public comments um, and share them with the PSC again at the state public hearing. So again, we, what we've done since our last meeting is outreach to the towns, 
listening their input. Um, hopefully we can review this collectively, um, address your concerns, um, and invite corporate counsel to also um, identify any other uh, topics to consider. And uh, just move forward. So that's my update. Do you have any more questions? Uh, the next topic would be a division update. I'll just give you a quick update. Um, as you may or may not know, our division uh, is leading an effort to codify all county ordinances, every county ordinance, whether it's public protection, public health, your rules of order, will all be codified and uh, placed in a searchable document, which will be very helpful for not only the broader communities, but for realtors, <laughs> um, developers uh, come to mind, um, these people that we experience. I'm sure it'll create some efficiencies with simple zoning calls. Um, our vendor, which is Munico, has gone through and vetted all of our ordinance. And what has happened is, again, Tim Anderson, our county planner, collected them all, sent them to our vendor, Munico, they went through them, identified those that were antiquated, those ordinances that were conflicting, um, just cleaned them up. I've also looked at ordinances that may no longer align with state statute. And so now where we're at is we're in the final phase. Unicode has sent all those back to us, and Tim is reaching out to all the departments and asking them for one final review. So. Hopefully, um, you know, it's a busy time. Hopefully folks can find the time to do that. Um, we have a tight deadline, and it is December 1st. We hope to get all that back, all those reviewed ordinances back to our vendor. And then um, surely next spring, we'll have all of our code available to anyone. Searchable, research, research, research. Sounds like quite a project. It's, you know. <laughs> Uh, personally, this is my third time dealing with this type of issue, and I, coincidentally, I've always, we've always wound up with that vendor, and uh, it's night and day. And to be at this point is really, really exciting. But, uh, you know, you look at most, even small municipalities, they have their code online and searchable. And so it's nice to be able to join that, that sort of venue. Um, just wanted to share that with you because um, you're right, Sharon, it's a big project. Um, so with well, that, the, the fact that they're going through and saying this needs to be updated, this is obsolete. But, I mean, this that's, is, yeah, this is, a, this is a obsolete because it no longer aligns in the statute. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. Right. So the vendors are based out of Florida and um, a group of lawyers, and they do this for a living. And, What's nice about that, as going forward, anytime you as an elected official, you pass a new resolution, change your rules of order, for example, we adopt a new ordinance, we send it to them, and they spend a little time codifying it, but it's available once it's passed for the public. It will be on the homepage. Like, this is still yet to be incorporated, but it's available this new rule, this new law, this new ordinance. Um, and, and so, it's a living document that as you make decisions will quickly be incorporated. And then you have that institutional memory in place right away. Whereas nowadays you kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey. Huh? Oh, hey. Good. Oh. Oh, hey. What's up? Reasonable. <laughs> it's a project. I think in the past, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Leah, but we were thinking of hiring a paralegal. Uh -huh. oh, <laughs> At first, I was going to do it. Then we were going to hire a paralegal. I mean, it's, it's I'm grateful. <laughs> that you news, for all. Yeah. So. And then any, any of the ordinances that are not in the code, 
will become null and void. Because mm -hmm. there are ordinances that are referenced in different things that no one can find. Uh, that they're not in the clerk's office. They're maybe in some some hidden secret location. So then if there are new ordinances that we eventually want because whatever that old ordinance was, we you know we'll amend the code and but it'll just clean things up. Well, I'll treat to that. Tim spent a lot of time hunting down ordinances from the 1920s. <laughs> really? <laughs> so that were referenced to and Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a huge project. Uh, so there's a lot of ordinances in that where it was just the county board passed a resolution to change the ordinance and that, and that final draft of the ordinance was never pieced together. And that, so it's been pretty good. Um, I am lagging. I got to do all our land use review and that, but uh, it looks like they did a pretty thorough review and they're very, very timely on it. So um, the only downside to having this code is, you know, that when we do make changes to ordinances, we are going to have to pay to update the code as we go. So um, just yeah. the cost of doing business and making the information available. So. Glad you brought that up. And, you know, we, we reached out to other departments to have them do their final review. It's critical they do that because if there's an error that they miss or they didn't review it, and then in the future, we're referring to something that's lost, we have to make that change. We got to go back to the vendor and it's like fourteen dollars a day or something. Anyway, there's going to be cost to clean it up if we don't do it now. And how do how to pay for that? Will be cheap. So yeah, good news. Um, any questions? Chairman O'Connell, this is what we have. I um, forgive me. I missed what. Mo had to say, was he coming back next meeting? Again, our next meeting is December 2nd. <gasps> oh, Mo, did he say anything that he needed to be? No. no. So we won't have anything on tax with delinquent property. No, that's going to the real estate. Yeah. Good. So he's giving a real estate. Yep. Uh, coming back. Master plan for sure. Uh, we'll have an update on PTAG. Um, privacy fence permits, we'll probably talk about yeah. in both the shoreland and the comprehensive land use ordinance in yeah. both of those. So we'll have that. Um, we'll strike the tourist rooming house permits then. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Um, and then, like Jason mentioned, we have that rezone of the event center. Uh, Wedding venue in the town of Osceola. That is coming back December 2nd. <clears throat> Land and Water also has that transect survey. Remember me talking about that? We postponed it. The transect survey, agricultural survey. Oh, okay. We talked about it earlier when we were talking about only having one meeting this month. And you guys, it was scheduled for November, but we pushed it to December. 15 minute presentation on their, their survey of best management practices, no tillage, oil. Is that okay to add? December? 15 minutes. Good. Um, the joint development agreement, that can be on the 16th because again, That'll be the day after the deadline for the towns to provide input. For us. Um, and if you have any division left, that's kind of a place for you. No more. I'm sure Jason might do another application or two. Yeah. On that first meeting in December, though, that, that's not going to be reopening the public hearing. Yeah, so in other words, it sounds like it's a pretty light agenda, so we're going to take that right off the board. So. Can we close the public hearing for that? So that might, so we might not, well, there might be a public hearing, but for now, there's a public comment in that, that meeting, you know, in that, but unless, uh, I don't think they've opened up the public hearing. So. 
You want that at the front end then? Or we can put it at the end. The folks, some of the people here. Put that on the front end. The zoning part. The zoning part. Yep. Right. Is there anything else that it's round 11, Chairman O'Connell? I make a motion that we adjourn. Okay. Oh, <laughs> 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 